Thank you. Uh, good morning. This is a convening of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. We're holding this meeting virtually, and so I'll take a roll call. Good morning, Commissioner Bryan. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Hill. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Skinner. Good morning. And good morning, Commissioner Maynard. Good morning. Okay, we'll get started. Commissioner Maynard will be joining us by video shortly. Um, today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, and it's uh, public meeting number 449. We have uh, some minutes to address. Good morning, Commissioner Hill. Good morning. Uh, these were very long minutes, so uh, sorry it took a little longer than usual to get them to you. So if there was any issues, please let us know. Uh, but at this time, Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission approve the minutes from the November 16, 2022 public meeting that are included in the Commissioner's packet, subject to any necessary corrections for typographical errors or other non-material matters. I can second. There was just one typo where I think there was a phonetic. It was supposed to say, I love. I, I lost it on the copy okay, that I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah th that was it. But otherwise, I, I second the motion. We will go back yeah. and fix that. If you search, I think ILB, I think it just had the E out or something. Yeah, like or it was ILF or something. I, I had it highlighted, but I had to reboot, so I lost it. I was okay. doing a public uh, hearing this morning, and uh, all the updates happened right beforehand. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That, that's what happened maybe on your reboot, Eileen. I had exactly the same thing happen to me at 4.30 right when I was leaving. And a big shout out to Olivia. She came up and my entire computer just. So uh, I've got a gremlin or something in mind. Poor Caitlin had to resend something to me like three times because it finally came through. And then when I rebooted, it was not in my inbox anymore. So I, I don't know what was going on. Yeah, I couldn't send any emails or see any. And, and luckily, Olivia was there and she came up and we backtracked and we realized, oh, you're in the middle of a, of a restart. Of a reboot. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to maybe figure that out a little bit, that it um, could be done, um, Executive Director Wells, in the evening because of um, there's now significant fear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, so with that got, said, um, we will we will fix that. Yeah, so we've got a second with that minor edit. Any other edits or comments? Commissioner Skinner? No, I'm just ready to take You're the ready vote. to go. Okay, no. Um, all right, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. Commissioner Skinner? Aye. And Commissioner Maynard? Aye. Okay, and I vote yes, so five zero. Excellent job on those. Um, those minutes and very helpful for us to review at this particular time. So thank you. We're gonna move on to item number three on sports wagering. We have three matters today. Um, good morning to um, Mr. Carpenter. Hi, Sterl, how are you this morning? Are you taking the lead on the um, on house rules or is this director ban? No, ma'am, uh, it's uh, uh, operations manager Carpenter will start out with the house rules today. Okay, excellent, thank you so much. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, today we are presenting Fanatics House Rules for review and approval. Enclosed in the Commissioner's uh, packet on page 14 starts the House Rules. Um, they were uh, sent to us uh, um, about three months ago. And then on uh, April 11th, we received the updated changes for all areas of concerns. Um, there were six areas that needed to be changed found by the sports division. In review, all areas are now in compliance with 247.02 subsection three. All areas changed included the removal of unapproved events and wagers. The, uh, just as a guide, Fanatics appears uh, to list their sports specific rules in order of popularity. There were uh, the areas of football, basketball, baseball, ice hockey, tennis, golf, soccer, boxing, MMA, motorsports, table tennis, darts, volleyball, winter sports, athletics, cycling, rugby union, snooker, pool, cricket, lacrosse, and Australian rules, football, and finally handball. 
So um, as you might be aware, um, this isn't as extensive as some of the others, but um, it is a very good list and I found their uh, house rules to be um, quite organized and in a very good um, um, format. Is if I'll open this up for any comments now by the commissioners. Um, uh, but the sports wagering division finds these house rules to be acceptable for approval. Commissioners, I have one comment, but I want to yield to you. Do you have any questions or comments? Commissioner Maynard, I, um, I don't have your facial expression. Are you all set for right now as we look at these? I, I'm all set with what's been said okay. so far. So the only question I have, I'll just get started and then uh, may come up with other questions. Um, Stero, if we look at the bottom of 16, page 16, the funding of wagers, and then it rolls over to 17. Commissioners, what I'm wondering about is, it says customers may fund their Fanatics account using any of the following methods. You know, debit cards is clearly cash, but I wondered if the other, um, mechanisms for funding needed to be clarified that it could not be credit-based or is that somewhere else, Sterl? I know it's certainly in our statute, it's certainly, um, but I wondered if we needed that clarification there. Um, the, several of our operators do state these types of wagers and that in the statute and in our regulations, we specifically prohibit the acceptance of credit. Yeah. But if you would like them to add that, um, I may not have picked up on it in other sports rules. This was very easy to oh. read, I have to say. It was very accessible, and that's probably where um, why I might have even caught it. Commissioner O'Brien? So it's funny. I, I flagged this in one of the earlier ones, and because I saw the Venmo and the PayPal, et cetera, and it was explained to me, and Stroll, correct me if I'm wrong, that like PayPal, Venmo, Apple Pay, they have the ability to distinguish how you've loaded so there is an ability to block a credit card funding for a payment, but if that's not accurate, um, then yeah, we would need to obviously dive into this more. So we do have uh, fanatics on this call. If they, if you would like to ask them in their yes, specific. Sure. Hi, Mr. Smith. Good morning. Hi there. Good to see you How all again. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing Hi, well. Sir. How are you? We're well, thank you. Great. Um, so yeah, real quick on this, it, it is correct that the, the providers can distinguish between credit uh, and, and cash-based deposits. Um, I'll also note our internal controls are clear that um, we're not allowed to, to accept any um, deposits based on credit. So if, if everybody's comfortable, if we use this kind of language across the board in house rules and it's that you know redundancy is, is elsewhere, then I'm, I'm comfortable with this and it wouldn't be misleading. We could um, further clarify and then just across the board ask people to clarify, um, you know, and in no event shall any of these sources be, um, you know, be themselves funded by a credit card. That would that would certainly cover any anybody who tried to say that they didn't realize that they couldn't do it based on a reading of this. It's probably not a big ask to make that change, Mr. Smith. Um, it, it's we, not. No, that, that's know. a quick, easy change. It, it might be just for there aren't that many states with this restriction, so it might be a helpful um, sure. addition. Mm -hmm. And as I noted, I did find your rules to be very accessible. Um, so I probably was e able to clear. skim and, and it registered um, more clearly. So it, it, it prompted a question. My apologies. Um, commissioners, do you have any other questions? Uh, Just process wise, uh, can we still move forward with these and knowing that there's going to be amended at some point? I, I'd like to make language. a conditional um, vote uh, of some sort. Commissioner O'Brien, you're nodding your head. You think that's good? I think we can move on the, um, and part of the motion be that um, maybe the direct reference to that section be amended accordingly, that um, the funding of wagers section be amended um, as discussed and agreed to at this hearing. Yeah, 
And then we would just um, just depend on Sterling and uh, legal to work with um, fanatics just to get that language. It'll be just fine. Right. And then uh, and also probably... circle back to the others to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Then you need a motion. I need a motion. You need a vote, right, Sterling? Correct. Okay, I need a motion, please. So, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the house rules submitted by category three sports wagering operator FBG Enterprises Opco LLC doing business as fanatics as included in the commissioner's packet and is discussed here today and specifically pointing out that they will be amending the section funding of wagers um, to incorporate the reference to no credit card use as discussed at the meeting today. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, Commissioner Bryan. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes. So five zero. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yeah, well done. Thank, Thank you, you. Sterl. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Before we go on to the next item, I want you to know we, we found the um, the edit in the minutes and it has already been addressed. So thank you for that, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we're moving on to um, item 3B. Director Ban, is that gonna be again, um, Manager Carpenter or are you taking a lead on yep. the approval that, certificate of operations? Madam Chair, that will be uh, me uh, handling this one. Okay, uh, thank you. That is the operations certificate for better. Uh, we, uh, uh, with this operations certificate, we're looking for approval. Uh, they have to have approval of the internal controls. Uh, they need all their vendors and sports wager employees uh, in place. Uh, compliance with any commission uh, uh, conditions of the commission. Uh, they need uh, uh, to have GLI inspection of their software and geofencing. Up to this point, uh, Better has their internal controls approved with uh, no, uh, major, no major findings uh, or problems with their submissions. Their staffing vendors and uh, non-sports wagering vendors are all approved. Uh, compliance with any conditions that the commission has uh, uh, is in place, including uh, uh, better sports book completing operational audits and wagering procedures and practices and technical security controls as required by the commission's technical standards governing supporting uh, sports wagering within 90 days of the commencement of sports wagering operations. They have their geofencing uh, capabilities have passed player management system has passed. Uh, their responsible gaming plan has been reviewed. Uh, the house rules have been approved. And uh, up to this point, they have passed all inspections and the sports wagering division recommends uh, approval of their operations certificate. Any questions or anything? Questions, commissioners? I'm just making sure everybody's having a chance to take one quick last yep. look. And um, okay, so you're looking for a vote today. Yes, ma'am. Commissioners, if you have no other questions, are you prepared to move? Madam Chair, I would uh, move that the commission find that the requirements outlined in 205 CMR 251 um, have been satisfied and that an operation certificate be awarded to Better Holdings Inc. DBA BETR 
for the purpose of operating a category three sports wagering operation conditional conditional upon better holdings inc dbr better completing operational audits of wagering procedures and practices and technical security controls as required by the commission's technical standards governing sports wagering at 205 cmr 243.01 1s and 205 CMR 243.01, 1X within 90 days of the commencement of sports wagering operations. Thank you, Commissioner Skinner. Okay, with that second, are there any edits or comments? All right, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. Commissioner Skinner? Aye. Commissioner Maynard? Aye. And I vote yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> with the upcoming draft, the NFL draft this week, we thought that it might be helpful um, if the, the sports wagering division uh, reported on the status of our um, rules around the NFL draft. Director Band, are you reporting on this? Okay. Yes, but both um, Mr. Carpenter and myself were we earlier in the, uh, this week, we, we met with the uh, NFL on the upcoming draft and uh, to make sure that our uh, regulations and uh, procedures were in place to adequately uh, uh, address the NFL draft and that uh, our procedures adequately protected uh, the mass uh, uh, sports books uh to to uh, protect our sports wagering uh, uh procedures in this state uh our procedures did in fact meet all the requirements of the nfl uh and going forward with uh basically uh items like having all wagers for the first round uh made prior to the first round of the draft uh, and so, so on. Uh, uh, Sterl, if you want to elaborate on that a little more, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so our rules dictate when a pick can be offered and when it must close. Um, all are in our event catalog. These were um, confirmed with the NFL that the time frame was adequate in their opinion. We are also reaching out to our licensees to assure that they will follow all of the um, stipulations of draft picks. They are separated into rounds, draft rounds, and actual uh, picks. Uh, picks prior, just as an information, must be picked at least two, round, uh, two picks prior to them um, being announced. Now, we um, are well aware um, and we, re we were uh, informed as well by the NFL that sometimes information can be leaked out. So that's why th we have these requirements in our rules to try and mitigate any um, knowledge prior to a pick. We are also open for any questions one might have about the upcoming draft. Commissioner O'Brien? Um, so I did, um, Stroll very graciously answered a question for me. I had a question about, um, were there any jurisdictions that don't allow the draft at all or had different rules about it? So I'm just looking for clarity, Stroll. Thank you for the list you sent. Um, some of them, it appears you can bet on the draft, but then it's a block. As soon as the draft starts, there's nothing during the course of it. It sounds like, uh, and you'd have to refresh my memory on our rules, that there's more of a dynamic interaction in terms of our rules on the NFL draft. Can you just walk me through that, Sterl? Absolutely. So um, we, we modeled ours also. Um, I, I, I will um, let everyone know that we modeled after Michigan. Michigan has a very successful uh, sports wagering um, uh, structure. They have, they have not, um, we, as a matter of fact, told the NFL, we modeled our structure after Michigan. Um, and they, and re they also reiterated that that is um, enough time frame they believe to protect everything. Um, the, um, just so that we're aware, 
our operators also have the ability to not offer certain selections, picks, rounds, anything that they feel might be uh, prohibited to them or knowledge to be get to be uh, released. Um, uh, there are currently um, options right now on our um, licensees websites that they can everyone can wager on right now. Um, so not only is Michigan and uh, Massachusetts, there is one other one that's escaping my memory at the moment that um, follows this um, sort of format, but that most um, will stop wagering before the round on, on round picks. You do not want to have something going on as a pick for the second and third round while it's in the middle of a round. So um, uh, I apologize if I haven't answered or clarified. If, if, no, if I so, haven't just. Yeah, um, no, so it looks like, I think Tennessee was the other one on the list yes, that was you. similar to Massachusetts and Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, I guess my follow-up question really is some of them obviously, I mean, you know, Nevada, you cannot bet in a specific player um, 24 hours prior to mm -hmm. the start of the first round, things like that. Do we have similar restrictions in Massachusetts? Uh, we, so as I was saying with those restrictions, those restrictions are uh, left up to the operator, but we can, um, the operator has the restriction that they cannot allow. If we are at pick five, they cannot allow wagering on pick six or seven. Right. They, they right. must, yes. It, the, but that's, that's not a population. block on a particular player, right? The way they, Nevada does it? No. Okay. Now, so the team what, I'm sorry, Commissioner O'Brien. No, what, what, what they will do, um, right? So just for knowledge, um, I the current number one pick is thought, and I say thought to be a particular player, so much so that the odds are prohibitive for a play for, uh, some of our books to wager against this pick. Now you're still allowed to do it, but you have to put up tons of money to receive a little. So that's how they um, mitigate their risk. And in terms of integrity of the process or inside knowledge that would affect this, is it the position of the team that as written, it's sufficiently protected? So in our meeting with the NFL, the NFL does everything in its power to clamp down on all information for their players. Um, as we have seen this week, the NFL has suspended six players on gambling to, um, you know, for violating their, their, their um, policies and procedures. So they do everything and try to do everything possible. But as they have said, a, a proud parent, and I would be one of them, might go to Twitter if it's minutes before. That's why we have the structure of, you know, somebody can't find out on Twitter prior to this pick, the person walking up to the stage, right? So there is no, these are all um, NFL teams, and they are pretty tight-lipped, as our history has shown, as nobody wants to give anybody else an advantage because of the uh, importance of the NFL draft. It is a hugely important thing to build your team. We Thank feel, you. yeah, we feel that the, the, it has great uh, constraints and protection for all of our wagering possibilities here in the Commonwealth. Okay. Thank you, Stroh. You're quite welcome. Thank you very much. Can I just have a follow-up question, please, Sterl? And, and Director Wells, you were also um, at that meeting, correct? So you're, you also have the same level of comfort um, that Director Bannon and Mr. Carpenter have, right? Um, so the only question I have is if that tweet went out, um, it, that wouldn't disqualify bets placed before the tweet, but it would disqualify bets placed after the tweet, correct? Well, I think not necessarily. Girl, chime in if, if I'm not. The, the way the regulations are structured is to prevent a situation where a tweet would impact the outcome. So it's an integrity issue. Um, Got it. So the, the, uh, the timing 
uh, and the, the ban on, on uh, uh, that's too close to when it's actually happening would prevent that. What they described to us was that it's a, it's a television show, you know, so there's there's a little bit of delay there. So that's why they're protected. So it's only, it's strictly with respect to the integrity. That's good. Okay, that, that's yeah, helpful. Okay. okay. All right, any other questions? All right, that's a helpful report. Uh, uh, the draft begins Thursday, right, Stern? Correct. What time? Um, you know what? Yes, yeah, it's it's, in, it's, uh, it's usually nine, but I just, I just want to make sure. Nine Eastern time. Mm -hmm. All right. At 8, 8, 8 p.m. Thursday, it kicks off. Eight. Okay. Always, always fun. All right. There, may, there are no other questions on that report. We'll turn to item number four. So under the open meeting law, we are required to uh, perform um, our executive director's uh, annual review and set her compensation. Um, in a public forum. This is by far Executive Director Wells' favorite meeting of the year. Uh, so um, we, uh, we um, appreciate the process that's been set in place with the help of hum the Human Resources Department. Um, and with, of course, Karen's uh, um, very uh, um, helpful self-assessment, we were able to do um, our uh, personal uh, reviews and submit them to her. I don't know if commissioners, you had a chance to speak with Karen about your particular, your own individual review, but you have that ability to do so at any time. Um, so today we have um, really a conversation about our executive director and um, her performance. Karen, um, you may want to start with um, your your um, self-assessment and your, um, but I don't want to put you on the spot. If you would like to make an introductory statement, that would be helpful. And then we would go into our um, observations and review. And then we have the, um, the obligation to set your compensation for the year. Uh, and I, I think I should know the answer to this question. It would be retroactive back to the calendar year, January 1st. Is that correct, Commissioner Skinner? Uh, our treasurer, it would go January, it's calendar year, not fiscal year, right? That I'm not sure of, oh, Madam Chair. Uh, John, um, John is giving us the thumb, thumbs okay, up. Great. Thank you, John. John okay, thank you. Awesome. I'll go see Commissioner O'Brien nodding. Yeah, so it's it's um, calendar year. Uh, so thank you, I just wanted to make sure. We're okay. All right, so Karen, um, it's been a quiet year. Yes, <laughs> I, I think my only uh, statement uh, is a truly heartfelt thank you to the people that work at this agency. This was a rough year. Uh, we had a lot going on. There were a lot of people that put in a lot of extra hours, including commissioners, executive staff, and line level staff. Uh, and I am very grateful for all the work um, and the positive attitude towards what we had to accomplish and also the focus on integrity and doing the job well. You look at everything across the board from the IEB's investigations to the legal department's uh, uh, promulgation, uh, work on the promulgation of regulations, the communications department, Crystal and organizing all of this, the IT, finance, research and responsible gaming. There were a lot of divisions that had to um, work very hard and work collaboratively on this. So my message is uh, a genuine thank you to everyone uh, that works here and all that they did over the past year. Uh, I'm very proud of this team that I am privileged to work with and um, I'm looking forward um, you know, to many, many more things from them because they're just an outstanding team. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Commissioners. What would you like to share about your observations on Karen's uh, performance for the last 
really it's the calendar year, of course, we're looking at a little bit later, mainly because we were finishing up some important work at the, uh, the good deadline of March 10th. So um, who would like to start? Commissioner O'Brien? Sure. Um, I always start this off with, um, you know, I, I've known Karen probably longer than anybody else who's sitting here. So I like to do full disclosure on that one because I can go back to the prosecutor days with her. Um, so I'm not surprised every year when she does an outstanding performance. Um, I would agree that, as Karen said, this year was particularly tough. Um, there was a gargantuan task of launching uh, an entirely new industry and what tripling or quadrupling the number of licensees this agency now has to oversee. Um, and I am not surprised, but in awe of her ability to gather the third parties that were necessary to do that and to support staff in the manner that needed to be done to have that happen. Um, I think the appropriate response, if we had the ability to give sabbaticals, would be to give Karen a sabbatical for the summer and tell her she could go recharge, because I don't know of any other way um, to humanly let her recharge, which I think everyone on staff needs, but I think Karen in particular probably needs it more than anybody else, given the demands that were put on her and what she was able to produce this past year. Uh, I would like to say, and I've said this before, but now with these licensees, I really do think we as a commission have to seriously have this conversation structurally about giving Karen support um, in, this, in the form of a, a, an assistant executive director or C chief of staff or staff, something like that. Um, I know we've had additions in terms of HR that have been helpful, but I think it's been a difficult task before. And now with these licensees, I do think structurally we need to take a whole look at the organization and the agency to figure out how to best support the mission and her. Um, and then I, I constructively give this to Karen every year in terms of she's, she's sometimes too nice to the rest of us in terms of not putting up boundaries to make sure that she's got the time to do what she needs and to communicate with staff and to communicate with all five of us. So um, I would encourage her to continue to do that, to get the support that she needs to do the job um, but quite frankly, other than that, um, I think she just did a tremendous job executing what was an aggressive timeline and, and balancing five commissioners and a number of staff and third parties to get it up and running. So thank you, Karen, as always, like I said, I'm not surprised. Uh, and I do want to thank you. And if I could, if, if I could give you a sabbatical, I would do it because I think you need it. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Who would like to go next? I'm not sure anybody can follow that, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, that, that was uh, very good and very precise. And I think similar to what we all um, feel about Karen. And I, I too am in awe of what you've accomplished over the last, um, well, since January, but before January when we were, when we were given our marching orders by the legislature to get something done in a timely fashion. That would not have happened without your leadership and without pulling the entire staff together. You mentioned in your opening remarks, the, you know, the staff that you work with and the work that they put into that. And I agree with you 100%, the staff was phenomenal, but it took a leader to bring everybody together. And you were that leader. Um, I always think of it uh, in nautical terms because of where I live. You know, we were, we were a ship that was moving forward. It needed to stay on a straight line uh, and you made sure that it did. Um, so I share in Commissioner O'Brien's comments of, of being in awe of being able to accomplish what the commission put on you to get done. Um, not only for the commission, but for the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, in regards, you know, to particular um, things that we had to fill out, you know, in our review of you, you know, I, I look at the subject of, of the communication, uh, your communication skills continue to be very, very good. Um, your ability to build good relationships with everyone is, is one of the things I think is your strongest strength. You're very precise in your directives and effectively communicates um, what you need to get done with your team members. So that's something I think is very important. 
Uh, you always gather all necessary facts and information before finding solutions to what can be very difficult problems. And there was a lot of difficult problems uh, that were put before you this past year and you were able to address them in such a, a great professional and direct way. Uh, I think one of your best qualities as a, the executive director is that, you know, when you are when you're faced with a problem, you continue to listen first, take into account all the information, and then you try and come up with practical solutions. And you showed that time and time again over the last year. And your management skills, they continue to be second to none. Um, I, I, I talked to other agencies across the Commonwealth. Your name comes up very, very often. Uh, is somebody um, that people look to and want to emulate uh, because of your organization and your and your planning, and of course your interaction with others. Again, second to none. Uh, I have seen you personally continue to effectively manage your team. You treat your staff very fairly, equally, respectfully, uh, which I think has strengthened the entire team. And you've maintained a culture of transparency and knowledge sharing across all levels of the commission and acknowledge the employees, you know, good work, which, again, we all look to the staff and, and we, as, we're, as we sit here and recognize Karen, we also recognize the hard work that you do. So you've displayed a very highly consistent level of performance in your work. You've gone above and beyond this past year, no questions asked. Uh, I have found you always, you know, seeking opportunities to be more productive, your positive attitude. And believe me, Karen, that's so important, especially this past year, that positive attitude that you always have uh, with your work encourages others to perform well, too. So um, thank you. I know it's been a very difficult year. I know um, it's been very stressful for you and your staff but your leadership um, afforded us the ability to get through what we needed to get through, especially with the sports wagering. And I want to remind people that um, we weren't just doing sports wagering this year. We still had to do our day-to-day -day operation stuff. Uh, and you were able to corral all the issues that you deal with day in and day out, as well as sports wagering. So I applaud you uh, for your efforts in this last year. And I thank you for a job well done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Skinner, would you like to chime in or Commissioner Maynard? I can go next. Um, I think Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Hill has pretty much, have pretty much covered it between the two of them. Um, so this will be easy for me. Um, I, um, was on, I only served as commissioner for um, three quarters of the year last year. And, two quarters of that, it was all sports wagering all of the time. And so I think um, it doesn't need to be reiterated, but I will do it anyway. Um, you accomplished a Herculean task, you and the team in getting um, sports wagering launched in, you know, what uh, felt like a, 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 a very challenging timeline, um, but, I'm not surprised um, you weren't kicking and screaming. Um, you, you, you got it done with a smile on your face and all while supporting the team and any concerns that they might have brought your way. Um, I said that Commissioner Hill and Commissioner O'Brien have already said everything there is to say about you professionally. So I, I won't belabor those points um, except to make it clear that I agree with every single word. I think you've done an outstanding job as executive director, um, but I'm choosing right now to brag about and commend you on your personal attributes that you bring to your role as executive director and a leader. And we, you and I have had the opportunity to meet, so you're not hearing any of this for the first time. Um, but I, I think, Karen, you lead with kindness, humility, respect for and of others, and a listening ear. And those are all qualities that are essential to the cohesion of this agency. We saw, we saw that during sports wagering implementation, as you indicated, it was a very rough year. Very challenging to meet some of those deadlines, but every step of the way, um, 
you, you, you met expectations and often exceeded expectations. But above and beyond any professional achievement, far more valuable than your professional successes, I think both here and over the course of your career, it's your ability to make human connections and cultivate relationships that I think makes you an exceptional leader. And Karen, please don't ever lose sight of that because your team, our team, relies on that. And that's what makes them to continue, excuse me, that's what makes them continue to show up for you and for this commission. All that said, um, before I can put a bow on that, I wanna see you give yourself the same care and attention you give to others. And I hope you are finding that you're afforded the grace and the space to do that. So once again, job well done. Um, very proud of how um, you have led this agency over the past year. Um, and I am looking forward to uh, many, many years to come under your leadership, Karen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Skinner. Commissioner Maynard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Karen, I have to say that um, I was really excited to get this appointment last year. And in July is when it became public. I didn't start till August. And oftentimes, uh, the second thing said to me after congratulations from many people that I've met over the years was, you're going to love Karen Wells. And, um, and that really speaks to, you know, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum from Commissioner O'Brien. I've probably known you from the commissioners the least, but uh, everyone that I knew um, and I met thousands of people of my time in my prior position, um, leaders from every agency and, and government body in the state um, said, you're gonna love Karen Wells. So, um, and, and that's been true. Um, I won't belabor the point on the sports wagering piece. Um, I called you in your review and told you this um, when we spoke, that you're a thoughtful motivator. And that's, that's, that's rare, you know, that, that it truly is. Um, you really understand that people are policy and that to get something done in this agency that you have to motivate the people. Um, but you never compromise the end product. You listen to everyone. Um, you often have to deal with a lot of personalities and a lot of big personalities, um, but you do it with respect. But at the end, uh, you make sure that the best product comes out of it. That's really an art form. That's really an art form. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's been said, take care of yourself, you know, and, and surround yourself with you know, um, what you need to get the job done. You will always have my support and, and I believe the entire commission support in driving um, the goals of the commission. And I'm just thrilled that I have an opportunity to work with you. And um, I think you are a fantastic executive director. Thank you. Um, well, I guess, I'll, I guess I'll pick up where everybody else missed out, right? Executive Director Rosa. No, I just echo everything that my fellow commissioners stated. Um, Karen, um, I've had the benefit of, of doing this a few times. And, um, and because of that, I can say that I've watched you grow in this, um, in this role, but you started at a, you know exceptional level to begin with, but you have um, continued to grow and never just settle. Uh, you know, I, uh, for, for the, the high standard where you, where you started when I first met you um, as IEB director and then came over um, as executive director. So I've had the benefit of, of, of watching you, not as a, an old friend, but as a, a professional colleague and a partner. So I want you to know how much I appreciate you in that role. Um, we spend an extraordinary amount of time together and I am part of the burden of your day-to-day -day role. Uh, and responsibilities. So I'm hearing everybody saying you, you need a, a break. And I just want um, you to know how much I appreciated these last, and I'll just say really just from, from August, um, the um, accessibility that you granted me uh, so that we could um, in fact meet the deadlines that the commission set um, 
for the benefit of the Commonwealth. That was our mandate uh, to, to set um, a, a deadlines. And in setting them, there wasn't one time where you did not assure me that your team would not only be able to meet it, but also that you would meet it with the extraordinary integrity that we expect of the Gaming Commission and that the, the Commonwealth and its citizens expect of us as a regulator of this new industry. So um, you, you had your whiteboard, you had your, your lists. Uh, just recently you spoke in Las Vegas about that checklist and I just heard from someone today, I got an email about the exceptional job you did. Um, I'll start at the very end. We have um, a, nice, a nice format for assessing. And I did say Karen demonstrated exceptional leadership and managerial skills this past year as she worked to implement the new sports wagering law. She pivoted with the commission's decisions and directions and responded to the priorities and values we set. She is emerging as a recognized leader in the field, deservingly so. She continues, and this is the most important piece to me, to nurture the culture within the MGC. This is critical as exceptional new hires do expect a workplace where mutual respect and excellence are fostered. And your leadership is grounded in that last part. And that for me is the most meaningful. Um, a meaningful piece. As to your personal effectiveness, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Hill that your interpersonal skills and your ability to bolster your team are off the charts, exceptional. But as I said, where deadlines were clearly established, you um, were able to have your team um, meet them. I said that you, you noted yourselves as a result-oriented leader, and I had said at one point that where deadlines are clearly established, the staff is extraordinary in meeting them, a tribute to its professionalism and dedication and no more, no greater um, form was that tested this past six months. Um, and it was a tribute to your leadership. And as I said, the professionalism and dedication of your extraordinary staff. Um, I never doubted the team's ability and commitment and you, Karen, should be very proud of this past six months results or eight months, wherever we are now. But I also want to know that this year started back in January of 2022. And I was pleased that Karen noted in her assessment her effectiveness in transitioning the team to the hybrid work model that is going so well. We see more and more members of your team coming back under your hybrid model. I think they like being together and that is not happening across the country. And so I think you should be really proud of that hybrid work model working nicely. Um, you have, you were pushing forward with regulatory review and it's a really important piece of work given that you were at that 10 year mark for regulations. And I know you wanna go back to that. And you drove implementation of our DEI action items. And for that, I am so grateful. Part of that vision was to hire um, our chief um, people and diversity officer. And he has been um, really woven into your daily management. And I think to really a credit of your leadership and management um, has been so effective in nurturing the culture of the organization. Um, I also wanted to commend you for something you didn't mention. I don't believe, unless I missed it in your assessment, was that you implemented your fair pay framework. And that was a very big piece of work that you, you did in such an equitable fashion. And that's how you lead with fairness and equity. You want everyone to be treated equally and fairly with the same degree of respect. And, and that's across the agency and among all commissioners. And we feel that, Karen. And that um, great work of the fair pay framework really established an equitable approach um, for uh, this agency and, and a framework that you can depend on. And I know that you will, just as you're doing to the regs, you'll continue to tweak that and make sure that remains an effective tool. So uh, those are a little bit more granular comments because I just wanted to make sure that everyone did understand as Commissioner Hill alluded to that business was going on um, and we never missed a beat on, on not simply our regulatory oversight, 
but also improving the tools within the agency. Um, and finally, I think I would just, you know, say that, um, you know, where Commissioner Hill mentioned and the others, I, I applaud um, everyone's uh, comments that you're, you're, we have these five categories, I think it's five, and your interaction with others, and that is internal and external is exceptional. You, um, you can laugh, and, and you and I have laughed sometimes when we might as well have been crying, but you um, can always see um, the, um, the positive side, and Commissioner Hill used that word as well, and to get the job done. And I, um, <clears throat> I, I sense that it's not just ever checking it off. It's always done with the degree of intentionality and purpose and thoughtfulness that the, this um, exceptional team deserves and um, what you as an exceptional leader um, can effectuate so for that. I'm grateful, Karen, for your leadership. I am grateful for your work on standing up sports wagering uh, to the benefit of the Commonwealth. There is a lot of work ahead and I do hear Commissioner O'Brien suggesting a sabbatical. Um, Karen, uh, could you wait maybe a couple more years, please? <laughs> no, we all want to be very sensitive um, to uh, the, the health and well-being of all the entire team. I do have on Grace Robinson's list, um, who is a great event planner, um, some kind of a celebration that will be at least um, a break in the course of a day, Karen, for you and your team. But we do, um, we, uh, uh, I join all of my fellow commissioners thanking you for the extraordinary efforts that you and your team have performed in standing up the sports wagering um, industry uh, as we were required to do by law. So thank you. And with that, I guess, unless we have other comments, we probably should turn to setting the compensation. We have a document in our, in our, um, our packet that um, I want to commend uh, the team effort on that. We um, got some information from uh, HR and Trupti, and they looked at other jurisdictions as I think we had suggested might be helpful. Uh, and of course, we looked at immediate uh, comparables as we've done in the past. Who would like to start with this conversation? Well, everybody loves to talk money. Where's Derek? <laughs> he's, he's always comfortable speaking money. Commission, and we've got no, and Derek, I was kind of teasing, meaning you're always comfortable talking dollars, but here we are. Commissioner um, Hill or Commissioner O'Brien, I see you're- you Commissioner O'Brien. Um, oh, go sorry, ahead. Commissioner Hill, I was wondering if it might be helpful to just go over, you know, what the summary was that, um, that Tripti Banda good. put together to sort of lay the framework for the conversation. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So um, that's on page 179 of yep. our packet. This is a long packet, but I assured Grace that it's not as long. I think we have had one that goes over a thousand pages. So that was our biggest day yet. So here we are, 179. Um, as you can see, we have um, in front of us the comparables that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and Executive Director Wells, um, her salary is right now at $207,400. Um, Executive Director um, of the Post Commission is at $198,550. And the Executive Director of the Cannabis Control Commission is at $201,880. All three agencies are independent agencies with um, um, different degrees of commission um, um, level of um, oversight. Uh, Cannabis Control Commission, I think, mirrors ours almost entirely, not quite. And then the Post Commission um, has a slightly different commission oversight structure. So, Madam Chair, I guess, and maybe someone answers this for me, but one of the things that I forgot to ask um, Tripti about, and I, I don't think she's available right now on this on the meeting, but um, in terms of the options when we get into that, I know that there are. Um, 
merit increases versus bonuses versus COLAs um, also impact the pension differently? Um, and I was just a little unclear on exactly which impacts what. I know, you know, retro and COLAs just go in, but whether merits are sort of taken off the table, um, I was just curious if anybody knew the answer to that. I think Derek can explain that. Um, that was put in there really to mark that conversation, right, uh, Derek, yeah. as a reminder, um, the difference between um, a, a bonus perhaps and a salary increase. Go ahead, Derek. Correct. So merits and COLAs are salary increases. So those would impact the pension um, um, long term. As far as a bonus goes, that's a one time increase. You Got don't it. pay for those year after year. So that wouldn't impact the pension. Got it. OK. And that's because they're treated like one offs, basically. Correct. Got it. Right. OK, thanks. And I, think it's, I think the general rule for the pension is the top three um, annual yep. salaries that's are good. averaged yep. out. So that's why. Right. That could, um, it could, but it might not, right, impact ultimately. Um, the next uh, paragraph, as a reminder, um, the MGC did provide our team with a 3%. Uh, um, now that says retroactive to the start of the fiscal year, Derek. Um, so that the team got back to 2022, June of, end of uh, July 1st, 2022, am I right? I think it was July 3rd or 4th based on how the pay period split up. But yes, it was July of 2022. Um, staff have always been on the July fiscal, on the fiscal year review and the executive director has been on the calendar year review. We can always adjust that and go retro retroactive if timing would be better over the summer to do this review. It's just, we're going historically, John was correct. Um, we've always gone back to the calendar year for the executive director. Yeah, and that was my memory. Um, Okay, and so um, uh, um, then we could in, we could consider um, an increase in salary, um, whether it's at three percent cost of living or something else. Um, we could also consider um, the merit bonus in addition to a salary increase, and that would be part of her salary, if I understand correctly. Um, and we could um, do a combination, a hybrid of a of a salary increase and a bonus. Uh, and I think um, I, I think I uh, suggested that we include that bonuses have been awarded to staff, including the executive director in the past. And Derek, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. Yes, so, for, so there have been two types of bonuses that have been given to staff in the past. Um, one was a on top of salary increases and that happened in 2015 when Plainville opened up for to recognize one-time efforts. And then for a few years, when, op when the category one operators were not pulling in any revenue, um, we didn't do raises for people that were making, we set a threshold and anyone above that only got um, bonuses and no increases, no colas. Um, so their salaries stayed flat. We're not, I can't really talk to that right now because I, I report directly to, um, to Karen about a recommendation, but I don't think that's a situation we're living in right now. So, and John can help on this, and that's why John Correct. is here today. Correct. So, so I can give you all the history. I just can't make a recommendation because Karen appoints me. My statue. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, John, that's all um, just straight back. Correct, John. Excuse me, what was that, Kathy? That's all, that's all, uh, all facts situation that that's Derek right. laid out, right? Yep. Okay, and then we have on the memo, um, it was really helpful how it was done in terms of the, the jurisdictions and those that have both gaming and sports wagering. Not sure if any of them also have eye gaming. I don't, I think Michigan might. Um, New Jersey isn't put in here. It is a slightly different construct or a different construct as is um, Nevada, but um, these are really good comparables. Uh, we, of course, I think uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you had considered, you know, what do we look at in terms of the, near, the um, jurisdictions near us because of our high price of um, you know, cost of living. So we have New York there, which is a good comparable. And then of course, Maine has a different um, cost of living and uh, <clears throat> and then Pennsylvania Pennsylvania of course um, 
It might not have the same cost of living, but it does have a high degree of complexities because they have right. so many casinos. And I think right. that's probably a distinguishing factor there. Um, so uh, <clears throat> Maryland uh, might not have the same high cost of living, but I bet it enjoys that in some places. Uh, it's a 2020 number. Right. And gaming some sports wagering was just laid out. Yeah. Right. Right. So some of them are a little, yeah. Right. More stale than others. Yeah. So, um, Karen, um, I am going to, and I and I I don't want Karen's words to work against her, um, but when I before we got this memo, even I asked her about. Um, the cost of living increase. And Karen, at one point you said, I, don't, I wouldn't want to get higher than the 3% cost of living, that COLA. Um, uh, we could go higher on the COLA, but I'd like to be consistent with that perhaps, and then think about where we could increase her salary or um, grant her a, a well-deserved merit um, or, or a bonus increase. Um, but Karen, that 3% was that measure that you mentioned that seems, and that would go retroactively um, uh, back to, um, I guess it would be January 1 in our case. With that said, I I'll allow her that, but I want to make sure that her leadership and, and the, you know, the review that we just gave her is very well reflected in um, um, either both a salary increase and a, um, a, 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 a merit increase or, or a bonus or both. So I'd love to hear, we could do a higher, we could do a four or 5% COLA, but I just wanted, and, and John is shaking his head, that's absolutely within um, our realm of, I just wanted, Karen had noted that, but we don't have to, I, I note that mainly because I want her team to hear that. We can go higher. Um, if we want on that three, that goal as well. Uh, thoughts? Commissioner Bryan? Oh, um, Commissioner, Hill. Hill. Commissioner Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Hill, yes, you shifted on me, Commissioner Hill. I should pin you. No, go, go ahead. I was, I was going to recommend 3%. Um, oh. Cost of living. Cola. Yep. Yeah. And then I'm then I'm up for discussions if anybody wants to add anything to that. But that's that's my starting point is three percent. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. I like even numbers. So um the three percent, if I'm not if my math correcting John, you know, I went to law school for a reason. Uh let me know if I'm wrong. Uh it would be up to two thirteen six twenty-two. So my recommendation, um my recommendation would be up to 215. And then I would like to have a conversation about a, a merit bonus or some sort of bonus for the sports wagering effort. I know there's probably a deeper conversation about staff all in. Uh, if I'm reading Karen's thoughts, she'd probably like us to hold off on that till we talk about staff in general to see what the budget can handle on that. But I absolutely believe um, that is in order for the performance for 2022 as well. So a 4% increase would put Karen in the realm of 215 and change. Um, so that, that, that would make sense. Okay. And then the 3% is the 213, 622. Give me one sec. I'll, I'll get that for you right now. That's the number I got, Commissioner O'Brien. That... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I am not a math person. <laughs> When I waitressed, I could calculate the 15 to 20% really quick. That was about what I focused on, yeah. Commissioner O'Brien, did I hear you say that you would wait on a, um, a, a bonus? Is that what you just said because of the um, the budget issues? Did, is that I'd like to know about, right. And then I, I also think there's probably a deeper conversation about um, you know staff also in terms of uh, sort of a sports wagering merit bonus. And Karen's kind of nodding her head at me. So I absolutely think it's warranted here. But I'm wondering if it's a, a bigger conversation where we look at the budget and figure out um, that sort well, of an I agency. Know that, and, I know and that 3 the three percent is I'm, is two thirteen and change. Okay. So, Chief um, um, 
Muldrew is going to be working with Karen on the bonus, um, the merit uh, issues, and that's really within mm -hmm. the um, the HR world and not really in our realm, right? We want to respect that. I understand the budget issues, what you're saying. Right. Um, yep. We do have our, our budget people here, and today is our obligation to set compensation. I wonder if we can consider the the, the three or four percent increase, and also grant um, a merit bonus in light of today's discussion. Unless, um, and then, um, and that those dollars would be the first up. Um, and I know that we have the ability to, to um, budget wise to, to do some kind of a recognition for a bonus. We could then revisit if we wanted to increase it um, after the staff. Um, but I would think that we would have missed an opportunity to acknowledge Karen in compensation for all that she's achieved at today's meeting if we rolled it over completely until the staff discussion. Um, I don't want the apples and oranges to get mixed up. Um, yep. Certainly, Karen doesn't want the burden of either saying, you know, I've, I've got to, you know, figure out this because it's also Derek and me. You know, we just, you know, it's not. Um, so I think today's burden is on us to figure out um, that that um, if we want to go forward with a merit or um, um, uh, so, so Kathy, yes. if I could maybe give you guys some perspective, mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, just kind of as like one metric that's out there, um, Social Security uh, this past year was increased 8.7%. Um, now, speaking as to our capability with the budget, um, you know, we are within budget. and By definition, we're like underspending, which is good. Um, typically, as good stewards, Derek and Agnes, my predecessor um, have uh, reverted between two and 3% each year um, back to the uh, licensees. Um, and this year will be no exception. Uh, we expect to do something close to that as well. Um, and just to give you some, some perspective on what 1% is, you know, just for the gaming control fund, 1% is around 360,000. So, um, you know, what we're talking about is really just a, a, a drop in, in, in the, the bucket. Um, as far as um, you know, savings goes, um, where we have had some savings, like with MSP, we've had some vacant positions. So there's some turnover savings there. Um, we've increased uh, our FTE counts um, for the agency as a whole, like to, to up staffing for um, sports wagering and our initiatives. Um, and, you know, we, we still have some open positions and some savings there. Um, and then, you know, a, a big kudos to um, the revenue group, um, you know, Doug O'Donnell and his team, and also with the licensing, licensing group, uh, Carol Bryan and her team. Um, we have an additional $1 million that, you know, we were not expecting or, or wasn't really accounted for, um, for revenue from licensing for sports wagering. So, so we, we, were, we have the capability to do this. Right, and, and can I just add that the, what John just went through, of course, those are our state dollars, right? Um, they, you know, it's, it, there's an assessment and it's, it's to the operators, but in fact, it, we, they are state dollars. So I, what I liked John's leading wow. with that we are very, very um, responsible stewards of these dollars. And we have always been very transparent and careful. I um, I think our um, the operators witnessed um, this team's extraordinary work. Um, they appreciated the team's attentiveness with respect to not simply um, making sure the uh, process was filled with integrity, but also the, the highest standards with respect to consumer protections, with respect to um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, with respect to um, community engagement. We asked of the operators so much um, in terms of their assessments. They saw Karen and the team in leading that process and they saw how it was led in a timely fashion and in an exceptional fashion. Um, they also know that we are responsible regulators. And so today I think we can have an honest discussion 
in a fair discussion to uh, uh, compensate Karen for this work that was so well done. Um, but I really appreciate your leading with our um, that frugal, um, the frugality, John, that we all very, very much. Uh, I, you know, my husband often says, I wish that you treated our dollars like you treat um, your work dollars. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I am, I'm comfortable with uh, getting to um, a number, um, however we do it, of the, um, the 4% would increase the salary for pension purposes that would get it up to 215, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, I, um, I, I, I am imagining a, a, a merit bonus of some, some degree of substance. Is anybody thinking of a number? Commissioner Skinner, you have your audio on? Yeah, I was hoping to weigh in on the, the uh, salary increase. Okay. For Karen. Um, sure. I, I'm certainly in agreement with 215, but I would um, go slightly higher than that, actually. And, you know, however it is, um, we need to do it to get above that, slightly above that. I think we should go for it, whether we identify it as a cost of living increase or merit increase. I would like to see somewhere around the ballpark of um, 217, 308, and I got that number by taking New York and Pennsylvania, the two closest um, uh, states uh, to Massachusetts that are included on our sampling in terms of um, similarities in, ter in terms of uh, jurisdiction. Um, and th that, that's the average of those two numbers. So- Which two, um, I'm sorry again, which two? Um, New, York. New York and Pennsylvania. So that's the number I would be comfortable with. I'm happy to see that the starting point, it seems to be 215. Um, on top of that, Madam Chair, I think you're right. I, I also would like to take advantage of this opportunity today to also assign a merit um, bonus or some kind of bonus to really recognize uh, Karen and her work over the past year, particularly on sports wagering. And as has been mentioned, the pay equity assignment. Commissioner Maynard, do you want to weigh in? I, I'm comfortable with a 4%. And then um, I, I heard what Commissioner Skinner said, you know, however, we have to figure it out or, or compensate it into this. Um, I, I would want to see some sort of merit based bonus for sure. Do you have a number in mind? It's okay to say not yet if you're not enough. I've, I mean, in, in full disclosure, I've reviewed the numbers that were sent over from HR um, and, and looked at those. Um, I believe, and I could be corrected on this, that the number was somewhere around $15,000 bonus from HR, their recommendation. So I would have to start with that number and then adjust accordingly, I think. Um, but that's, that's kind of where I am, but I am comfortable with 4%. Mm -hmm. Michelle Bryan. So yeah, I'm trying to find the memo. I know there was another one that laid out different numbers for us. Um, I think what Commissioner Maynard said is kind of where I was too. Uh, the four percent and then uh, the the bonus for the the slog of the sports wagering launch. Um, I couldn't recall the number, um, Commissioner Maynard, at the fifteen, but. That it is, yeah, that's what it was, and and yep. it was a bonus. He did put it yes. um, as a bonus, which would yep. of course mean it would be external to the salary increase. Correct. Um, yep. If I look at uh, Massachusetts numbers, that puts Karen in a, a, a at two fifteen a, a very um, good place for salary, mm -hmm. um, with a fifteen thousand dollar bonus that would certainly um, recognize again. Um, not just back to August 1st, but uh, the work that preceded it, which was eight months beforehand. So, um, you know, the, the launching of sports wagering happened this year, um, but she was ready to go at the end of the calendar year. She knew she was making her, her deadline. So um, the path forward uh, um, into this year, Karen, you, um, you knew that your team would make it, 
uh, you pivoted with us and our demands, as I said earlier. Uh, I'm comfortable with that recommendation. I think probably hey, it's May I ask a question before yeah. we sorry. move forward? I'm, I'm sorry, sure. Uh, I wasn't going to move forward. That was just oh. me commenting. Sorry, Commissioner Hill. Um, no, I, inter I, I interrupted you. No, sorry. I was just comfortable with the 4%, 3 to 4%, but the salary at 215 makes sense to me. Um, Commissioner Hill, the um, 15,000, that, that number was put out there. We could discuss that, but that would not be part of the salary. Understood. My, okay. quest my question is, when it comes to bonuses, um, we, did, we didn't ever discuss this last year when I was here. So this is first uh, that I'm hearing that we give bonuses or, or that we are suggesting a bonus. Um, have we ever given any bonuses to any of our employees? Have, yeah. Or is it only yeah. to our yeah. management team? No, yeah. it's actually, Somebody, we have. It's, yes. And it's so, actually going to be part of Karen and um, David Malchu's work going forward. Uh, the the uh, entire team, um, has been informed that, that that that's a possibility for them and Karen and, and Dave will work on that. So and, that, that's and the, go ahead. To put a finer point on it in terms of sort of event-based bonuses, the one that sticks out most recently to me was COVID because we had certain people who kind of had to come back, you know, <clears throat> in person earlier than others, facing more exposure than others during that time period. And so we had pretty in-depth conversations about bonuses to people um, as a result of COVID closing and reopening. That's the one that jumped out to me most. So to be clear, <laughs> management and employees of MGC. Yes. Correct. No, okay. uh, line and, um, and, and uh, executive staff and the executive director, I know in the past um, that, that preceded Karen um, received a bonus mm -hmm. of some sort, Derek, correct? Um, um, it, a different size um, bonus. Um, <clears throat> That's correct. But, that, is, that is correct. And the first program um, is more along the lines of what I think Commissioner Hill is getting at, where we had a committee that reviewed all the recommendations put forth. It was made up of both management and staff level. And then a lot of the bonuses went out to staff level for their individual contributions to the opening of Plain Ridge Park Casino and getting all of that ready to go. Um, so th I think that's more of the program that Karen and Dave are looking towards establishing for, um, for um, awarding bonuses for this last effort. Um, and I think that what you're hitting on is completely appropriate, Commissioner Hill, for us to think about as, as Dave and Karen put that program together. So this was this is new to me. So thank you. Um, I appreciate the history uh, of bonuses because that, that it was uh, well weighing very heavily on me that we may only be giving it to one individual when I'm looking at the entire staff and seeing what they did this past year was just as miraculous as what Karen did. Um, yes, you thank certainly have answered my question, and um, thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner Hill, I just you know the, we have a lot of. Um, a lot of material in front of us, but that was an important note that I did ask to be added to this memo that it does say bonuses have been awarded to staff, including the executive director in the past. And so, so it's I, all I missed that. All staff. No, yeah. So I just wanted you to, you're, it was a really important point that you raised and um, it, it was memorialized there because I, you know, it's, it's an important piece of information. So, so, so with all that said, I'm happy with 215 and I'm happy with a bonus. Okay, so now we can talk about the um, 215. Uh, uh, can we, I know Commissioner Skinner, you were thinking higher. Um, how are you feeling if there's a little bit, I think um, I'm leaning toward to the 4% the as well. So to get us at 215, how are you feeling about that? I feel, I feel fine with that, um, given that it's consensus, consensus, no problem with the 215. Okay, thanks. Um, and now, in terms of the bonus, um, the number that Commissioner Maynard raised was one that came to us um, um, from the uh, Chief uh, <clears throat> Diversity, uh, Chief um, People and Diversity Officer, uh, Chief Muldrew. Uh, how are we feeling about that? 
I'll throw out a number for discussion and to start the debate. <clears throat> I thought $10,000 was appropriate. Okay. I thought 15 was just a little high. Yeah. Ms. Harris? I'm okay accepting the recommendation that uh, came from HR on this, which was $15,000. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien? Um, I, I don't think 15 is outside the realm, but acknowledging Commissioner Hill, I could go as low as 12.5, splitting the difference. So I could do 15 or 12.5. I'd be comfortable with either. And then we do our best to give her a sabbatical. <laughs> Short of that, I, I'm sorry, just to, to, if I could just add, short of that, I think, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that we're factoring in um, the retention value of any mm -hmm. bonus that we're, we're, we're settling on. And, and, and I think, I just think that's an important factor here. Agreed. Yes, retention is important. Um, so, Karen. Retention, right? <laughs> um, I certainly could go up to twelve five as a compromise. I still think fifteen thousand is is high. That's my opinion. Mr. Maynard, I had, and I referenced this earlier. I had a unique position where I got to see thousands of people hired in the Commonwealth, right? And I think that the number one thing that, that we can do is make sure that we keep talented people, especially in this economy. Um, because in, the, in the, worker, the working market economy, people are you know, competing for employees, right? And um, oftentimes, and I do believe we should be good stewards of tax dollars. I, I built my whole life around it. But um, being a good steward of tax dollars also means that we're getting the best bang for the buck with the employees that are hired by the Commonwealth, right? And so for that reason, um, I would stick with what Dave Muldrew recommended on the 15, uh, understanding that and, and sharing Commissioner Hill's um, hope that we um, come up with something equitable for every employee across the commission. Um, but I, I would stick with the 15. Commissioner Hill, I respect your frugality. Um, and I know it comes from the right place, but I am um, going to uh, also align myself with uh, Chief Maltru's recommendation. Um, I feel that um, uh, in, in this, this, is, it, this is a bonus and it's an acknowledgement for this exceptional year, the full year. Um, and again, all of the work in addition to standing up the sports wagering, um, the sports wagering industry. Uh, I can tell you that the current New York and, and Pen Pennsylvania, they've, they've already done that. Uh, so this, this bonus reflects this past year. And I'm very at ease of, um, of giving that um, bonus of 15,000. And then uh, if we want to bring the salary up to the 4% mark, I'm comfortable with that as well. But I do respect uh, Commissioner Hill. Um, and and I, think, uh, I think it's fair that we all um, um, want to make sure that uh, the public and operators understand we respect very much um, our responsibility of being good shepherds um, with respect to these funds. Uh, <clears throat> but in this case, I feel the work we've uh, performed reflects this bonus. Should we do a vote? Are we we're, not talk, we're not talking a lot of money here. So, you know, the consensus is 15,000. Then 15,000 it shall be. Then okay. Um, I, I guess we should probably memorialize uh, this discussion in a in a vote if we're ready to move on that. Uh, but we also can expand. And Trupti, I do see that you're here. Thank you for the uh, memorandum. We appreciate it. 
So of course. can I ask, oh, I'm sorry, can I, so the 4% is retro to, is it seven, do we have the date, seven, four, 22? Or she, she won one, 23. She's won one, 23. We've done it on the calendar. Okay. For so her. it's retro to January one of 23. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm happy to make a motion, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. You're ready for it. Um, Madam Chair, based on the conversation today and the evaluation submitted to uh, Executive Director Wells, I move that we adjust the Executive Director's salary by increasing uh, a 4% cost of living retroactive to January 1, 2023. And in addition, that we um, authorize a $15,000 uh, merit-based bonus for uh, the 2022 performance review period. Second. And can I just clarify that that bonus is um, a separate and independent of the salary? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Any further questions or comments? Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes, and thank you. Thank you all, that's extremely generous, thank you. You're welcome, Karen. All right, I think it's 11.30. Um, I need a break. Have, we do need, a, <laughs> the, the, now we have a, a slew of regs to go through. Um, I don't know exactly what um, the timing will be, but Todd, is it okay if we take, an, would it make sense to kind of take an early lunch break right now, um, 11.30 to noon, or do you want to do something different, commissioners? I prefer to have a, a little break and then maybe at one o'clock take a break if we need it. Okay. All right, then that's what we'll do. And just a reminder for those, um, uh, our, our work will extend into the evening tonight. Um, we will be conducting a public hearing at Everett City Hall in connection with Encore Boston Harbor's expansion proposal. So, um, We'll um, keep we we'll keep on working uh, into the evening, commissioners, and for that, uh, a big thank you. Mina, does that work for you? I just see you coming in. We're going to take a short break and then we'll get going. Yes, Madam Chair, I was coming in to say that I think if if you took a break, we could very well be done by one. But I I hope those aren't famous last words. Let's give ourselves a, a quick break and we'll get going. All right, um, we convene at. Uh, Order out. Is that good? Yep. Okay. Eleven forty-five. Thanks, everyone, and thank you, Karen.
Hi, Dave. Thank you. No problem, all set. Okay. So, and we're all back. This is the convening of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, convening after a short break. Uh, we will roll call because we're holding this meeting virtually. Commissioner O'Brien? I am here. Commissioner Hill? I'm here. Commissioner Skinner? Here. And Commissioner Mayers? I'm here. Excellent. We'll get started. And we are now um, on our last item on the agenda, but we have a slew of regs to get through. And good, um, good morning still, uh, both uh, Todd and Caitlin. Caitlin, good to see you. I hope you had a nice break with your family. I did. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so Almost this afternoon, we will be uh, bringing a few regs back for you for your review. As you know, um, you will recognize some of these regs, 138, 238, 247, and 248 in particular are the regs that we will start with. Um, the commission has reviewed and approved these previously. They are currently in effect. But as we move through um, both the regulatory process and just standing up sports wagering in the state, um, we're learning more and more. And we would like to bring some amendments on these regs back to you now. So as you probably saw in the memo, the amendments are relate to a number of different issues. Um, and Mina Macarius from ANK will walk through those for you. So it's a little bit more, I won't use the word disjointed, but there's gonna be a lot, a lot more little issues today than, than you usually see. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mina. Thank Hello, you, everyone. good morning. And good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, so Madam Chair, I'm going to uh, just very briefly before we start, uh, give you an, an overview of the four that we're going to talk about. And the um, comp we've received a couple of uh, comments from the Attorney General's office, as well as uh, some of the Players Associations. I'm gonna explain how those fit in as well. Um, the, uh, they're sort of on two separate issues, but that's, that's why that we've been in, in conversation about. Um, the four regs in front of you are 138 and 238, that's um, Uniform Standards of Accounting Procedures and Internal Controls, generally, 138 for everybody, and 238 are the ones specific to sports wagering. And then uh, once we're done with those, we'll talk about 247, Uniform Standards of Sports Wagering, and 248, Sports Wagering Account Management. The reason these four are grouped together and are coming up before you, there's really uh, three sort of thematically uh, uh, purposes that we start, we're starting with these. Uh, one is to reflect some updates, and this is predominantly in 138 and 238 for category, category two um, wagering. Um, fairly, mi fairly minor overall, but uh, important edits. Uh, the second is, if you recall, in the process of developing the advertising regulations, we were in a uh, conversation with the Attorney General's office, and we, I had also uh, mentioned we would be coming back with a data privacy and security regulation, um, and that would be working with the Attorney General's office directly on that. Uh, we have a draft of that that's been shared with their team, um, and that they have started to provide some comments on just for, in, you know, as we develop it. We are working through that, that reg, or it should be before you shortly, most of, however, there are some um, portions that affect some of these other regs. And since they were due back today, we wanted to take sort of the lower hanging fruit in these ones. Uh, but um, I think, and, and Caitlin, Carrie, and Todd can correct me if I'm wrong, the idea would be to take a vote and hold on filing uh, for these four so that if, if there are, as we get through the data privacy issues, we're done there. Uh, the last part is, uh, with the benefit of some time uh, with the industry being stood up in Massachusetts, um, players associations have made a, a handful of additional comments on some of the regs to make sure uh, th that uh, comments they had made before were sort of properly interpreted and make sense in light of uh, some recent events uh, in terms of player safety. So those are sort of the three thematic things. They don't all show up in all regs, but that's that's why we're going through these today. So. With that, um, 
I'd like to start off on 138. I'm going to direct you to the packet and I'll note when the AG's uh, office or other comments have come in um, where they are and we can we might, might have to talk about those verbally. Uh, there's not many, they're mostly uh, um, fairly minor. So uh, the first place is at page 184 of your packet um, is 138. Um, just as a reminder, 138, because it was a reg that's in place already, already shows up as a red line. So many of what appear as, as track changes or red lines here are not actually new. So I'm only going to cover new ones. Um, if, other, if I go through them, if, uh, so if as a hint, if they're double underlined, they're probably not new. That's sort of the, that, that means that they were in a, changed as part of your earlier process. Um, so the first change you'll, you'll note is in the table, just in the table of contents, uh, 13873, um, it's, it's actually not noted in your packet. Um, we are using the term confidential information as well as personal, personally identifiable information uh, to go beyond, a bit beyond it in the data privacy reg. So um, really throughout this reg and all of the regs, whenever we use personally identifiable information, you'll see the phrase personally identifiable information and confidential information. The distinction being confidential information might have to do, for instance, with someone's uh, ac patron activity, et cetera, as opposed to just their personal banking information um, you know, and personal um, secure information like birthdays and, and social security, et cetera. Um, okay, so um, just take your attention all the way down. Um, to 138.03 uh, um, on page 189, uh, small edit. Um, there was a, a little bit of confusion around the use of the term that the, that the uh, gaming licensee had to implement and abide a system of internal controls uh, within a period of no more than 30 days. Uh, that was really more of a transition provision for both gaming and sports wagering. I think at this point, uh, internal controls are in place uh, before uh, wagering happens. So that that was that was a small removal there. Um, Nina, I'm sorry. Um, I must be looking at it where the language that's omitted um, isn't showing up. I'm looking, or it's just a comma on 138.03 that's taken out. Nothing. Um, Am I looking at something? I'm looking at the it's, sorry, it's 138. Oh, I, I apologize. It's 138027. That's that's why, uh, Madam Chair. My apologies. Um, oh, that and, makes more sense. Okay, now I see the period. Thank you. Period. My apologies. No problem. And then, um, does, does that impact the um, those? potential licensees that are in the pipeline? Um, as I understand it, it should not because the way you've been approving uh, internal controls first and then issuing um, operational certificates um, and Todd or, or Kayla, like, again, let me know if I'm, I'm misunderstanding that procedurally. Okay. So I, you know, so it shouldn't because those should be in place beforehand. I think it's, it's okay. Good. So that's really just kind of um, an edit that reflects our practice as opposed to something correcting for the future. All righty. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next um, place I'll call to your attention, and, and there's very little in this one, to be honest. Uh, one thirty-eight um, in, in general. In one thirty-eight. Oh, 09, uh, this is just um, at the end of 138.09 um, on page 199. Um, we, um, we, this I think was in here already that, but there was a question that came up about it just to, in, in the comments I wanted to address. Uh, this says essentially that nothing in the internal controls relieves a, uh, an operator of having to 
prepare and maintain records for any other purpose, including 223N or 205 CMR, there was a question, um, was that cross-reference supposed to be to the sports wagering internal controls? And the answer is no, it was intended to be for anywhere else in, in 205 CMR. So if they're a gaming operator, they may have other obligations. Their sports wagering operator it might be somewhere else in the, in the 200 series, uh, for instance, with respect to their advertising logs, which would be in 256. That's just a, a brief pause on that question. And I apologize, as, as Caitlin said, this will feel a little bit less, uh, less fluid because there's a bunch of little things uh, to, to go through. No apology needed. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> um, that's not new, so I'm just gonna keep going. We're uh, going pretty far down here, so I'm just uh, getting us to the right page. Again, a lot of these were edits made in, a, in previous iterations. Um, and I'm working off two drafts. Of So we are actually going to go all the way down to, if I'm not mistaken, the very end of this reg um, in 138.73. So th this was the section, uh, if you recall, that had to do specifically with um, data security. Uh, it, it was a longer section. We were splitting onto the other reg. Most of the changes here uh, reflect comments from the Attorney General's office initially, uh, which have to do with uh, aligning this section properly uh, in their view and just making sure we're covering all our bases with other state data protection laws. And you, you'll see that term confidential information and personally identifiable information pop up. Again, that will be defined when we get to the, when we do the privacy reg, but essentially personally identifiable information is slightly broader than what this what is protected under state law generally as personal information. Confidential information goes even beyond that to information about an uh, individual's activity uh, on a site. Um, Mina, could you just give the page, please? The oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I thought I did. 261. 70, two, okay, 261. Yeah. We can put that in. Thanks so much. How about that? Yeah. 73. So that's really the only change from what we considered before, right? Correct. It's it's really the purple language is the change. Yeah. Is that update? The Attorney General's office uh, in their in reviewing the data privacy regs did make uh, one other suggestion that we would recommend. It's a fairly small one. At the end of D, the very last section of the subsection here. Uh, they would add the words or any other person or entity. So D would read the procedures to be used in the event the gaming licensee determines that a breach of data security has occurred, including required notification to the commission or any other person or entity. And so that's to ensure that their data breach procedures uh, are, you know, are capturing not just uh, the reports of the commission, but any other uh, required notification. Like under 93H and 93I, that kind of thing. So that was the intent under uh, section one, but this is to avoid any doubt. So uh, okay. we would suggest adopting it. Yeah. And that, that is it. And I think that was the only substantive comment from the attorney general's office so far on 138. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for me now on this rank? It makes sense for us to not you you want us to hold our vote did i get that right or? I, I i would like you to at least hold your vote till the very end if that's possible and take them all together is that 
um, just in case we need to go back and forth, but um, we're going to hold filing thereafter as well. So uh, the, the, the filing. So um, right now we have a consensus, no questions, right, Commissioner? Okay, thanks. Correct. So I will proceed on to 238. Again, fairly light edits here. These are the ones, the regulations applicable to sports wagering um, internal controls. Um, and in this case, um, red lines are new. So there's just, there are, there's no old red lines here. These are all new. So I'll, I'll walk through these. Uh, the first set of changes uh, to highlight is on page 271. Um, so the way that, um, if you recall way back, 238 and 138 interact is with respect to physical facilities. Uh, so I, initially at a cat one and, and a cat two, um, the portions of 138 that have to do with things like physical security, surveillance, monitoring, et cetera, would all apply to sports wagering areas uh, or sports wagering facilities equally. Um, that always contemplated CAT 2. As we're developing the category two regs, we wanted to call out places where there might be distinction. Um, for instance, uh, in uh, two, so you'll see three paragraphs in 271. The idea here is that uh, in one, um, in a CAT 1 facility, an individual who would be uh, supervising a surveillance department at a casino that also has sports wagering, um, account one, would normally be a key gaming employee because cat two employees would not be gaming employees. Uh, we want to make sure it was clear that they had to be at the level of supervision where they would be required to have an occupational license under 205 CMR 235. So that's just calling out that distinction. Um, to, to make sure there's someone of, of sufficient um, seniority and, and supervisory ability overseeing the surveillance department. Uh, the second one has to do with uh, the requirement that the facility be protected by security uh, at all times. Um, CAT2 facilities, unlike CAT1s, um, may end up not, uh, what may, may have times when they're closed. Cat one facilities are essentially open uh, around the clock. So that provision is to ensure that there's security even when um, a category two facility is not open. Um, and the last one, um, there were some advantages a cat one had in terms of ha already having room for law enforcement, bureau and sports wagering um, division um, personnel to be there. Um, in, in within the CAT 1 facilities. As we move to CAT 2s, uh, the floor plans might not necessarily have those spaces, so we wanted to call that out uh, separately. So those were the three issues in, in sort of crosswalking between the 138 requirements and things that may not already exist in a Category 2 facility that we needed to call out here. Any questions on that, commissioners? Commissioner Hill, oh, I think he's talking to somebody else. Um, I, I guess I'm just ask. I guess I'd ask to pick adequate space for law enforcement. Does that mean office space or does that mean standing space? Um, I believe it. It it could mean. Either, um, and this may be a, I don't know if um, Director Lilios is here, but I, I would say that this, I, as I've understood this to, to operate with the gaming side, it's really whatever space they might need to be able to do their jobs adequately. So that may be in some places uh, space simply to monitor the floor, but in others it might need some more operational space or to the extent they need to have some permanent um, space for equipment, et cetera. I didn't get a chance to look at 205 CMR 133 and 223. Um, I don't know if that explains it, Karen. I don't know if you have any insights on that. Sorry. I just don't, I wanna make sure we're not being ambiguous if there's an expectation to have built out office space for them. Yeah. Two. 
Um, yeah, I don't. Oh, Bruce, Bruce just joined too. Um, yeah. it, you it's have office to, space, Karen, for do people do audits and uh, uh, you know complete their their daily work on operations in the facility. So I think the expectation is that the way it reads is we would want them to have office space for staff. Is that the question? Maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Yeah, the question is, and in, in the reg itself, it just says that the cat in category two sports wagering facility, the floor plan required by the reg shall depict adequate space for law enforcement officers for the bureau and sports wagering division, and for designated agents for the purposes of these two regs. And I wondered if that meant that means building out office space, not simply being able to monitor. Yeah, yeah, and what we right. did we've done in the past with the other properties is that. Basically, the commission has to approve it. So the commission does have the authority um, to say that's not enough space. You've, you've got to give us some more space if necessary. I mean, I don't know if it warrants that, the word office space, but um, I think the monitoring space on the floor is a given, but I just wanted to make sure. All right. Um, Madam Chair, I, I might say um, if we if you if we want to call it explicitly, I would say adequate office and other space because I wouldn't want to limit it to just office. I agree. I agree. And surveil office surveillance and other space. I mean, because it's a there's a need for yeah. surveillance space as well. So we, we will add that in. Office, comma, surveillance and other space, maybe. All right. Thank you. Um, the, the next section um, is on the following page 272. Um, there are two sections that are new here um, with the, oh, sorry, actually three sections, uh, the three, three edits. Uh, in K, slight wording change uh, for clarification that house rules must comply with, with 240. 205 CMR 243, which is actually the GLI 33 um, reg. And that's just to clarify that the GLI 33 reg doesn't itself tell you how to write house rules. They just have to comply with those house rules. Um, L and M um, are to, to connect to the data privacy issues. Um, L is the internal controls requirement um, to have internal controls to safeguard confidential and personally identifiable information, as, as talked about before, uh, and ensure compliance with 2XX is the privacy rule. It will have a real number. It's not so private that it won't have a number. Um, and the statutes and other um, and other uh, and regulations from that exist in the state for data privacy protection. Um, M is uh, a comment uh, that was suggested by the Attorney General's office um, to allow some transparency on how operators uh, um, use computerized algorithms, automated decision making, et cetera, in their processes. Uh, this was, I believe, a version of this was in the original 138.73 before it was, uh, before we sort of took it out and, and put it some of it back in here. Um, so this, the idea here is. Um, again, to have, have a plan on file and internal control explaining how the operator will use these so that they don't get misused. Uh, two small additions to the draft you have before you. Uh, one, there's a typo in permissible. There's two Ps, so we only have one. Uh, it's on the fourth line down in M. And then at the end, um, the Attorney General's office has suggested, and this is you know for your, for your discussion, uh, and a to add the words and a description of the measures the operator utilizes to minimize the extents to which its use of any such systems promote addictive use. Um, so that is uh, going a bit beyond having a plan for how it will be used, but also including um, a plan for how to minimize uh, use of, of algorithms, et cetera, to, in a way that might create addictive use. Uh, so that's this section. I don't know if there's questions or, or feedback on, on this part, particular piece of it.
So this is we'd be in the internal controls. Mm -hmm. The AG's office is <clears throat> Can you tell me, Mina and uh, commissioners, I'm waiting for you to interrupt me, but can you can you tell me? You said this language was in the earlier version or was it in the... I, I'm going a little bit off of memory here, Madam Chair, so I, I yeah. don't want to misspeak, but um, the the beginning of the, the language, not, not to minimize um, the use of language, that's new, uh, but the language regarding use of computerized algorithms or how they're used, I believe, was at least discussed in or in a very early draft of 138.73, the data privacy reg. Um, I'm not sure, and I know it didn't make it into the one that was enacted, uh, but it is being suggested here as, as part of, of this route. And I just wondered why we didn't include it. We, we didn't include it as, uh, because we, at the time when we were doing the internal, the first round of the internal controls regulations, we took what was a much lengthier 138.73 and we had started getting comments from both operators and, and the attorney general's office that uh, I think led us to the conclusion that we should have a separate data usage and privacy reg altogether uh, that made more sense for sports wagering rather than trying to glom it on to uh, 138. Um, and so it's now sort of, it's now coming in to reflect um, that new reg regulatory piece. So this was this was one of the ones taken taken out of 138 with the intention to put back in here. <clears throat> Trying to understand the. I guess I think it's interesting that we're going to have at a minimum a description of permissible and impermissional uses of such practices and capabilities. I hope there aren't any impermissible uses that they would be reporting on. Well, what's important is just to remember this is for the internal control section. So when we say right. the description of impermissible uses, it's not to say it, it's to, al to allow an operator to make sure that their employees know you may not That's use not. this algorithm for the following. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So that's for the control. <clears throat> and if you were to give us examples, Bruce or others of the permissible uses, um, outside of the suggested language of the AG's office, what would that be? For, is it for security, for instance? Is it for integrity? Are there other, with those, those issues, I guess I wanna understand what, what we're using this for. Um, I, could, I could see AI being used for trying to find uh, betting rings or people that were sort of trying to influence bets or, or odds, something like that. Um, you know, something yeah. where you're using that kind of integrity. algorithm to find a, a problem, integrity issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. integrity, money laundering. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I know one of the, uh, I, I don't want to speak for the attorney general's office, but from my understanding and conversations with them about where this some of this idea came from and from their comment letters, just to highlight a few uh, things. Mm -hmm. I, I think part of this is to make sure that the commission has a set, an understanding within the internal controls of what algorithms are being used for and mm -hmm. so that you can assess your comfort. So for instance, if there is a use of these for certain marketing practices, but it is um, benign in the sense that it, you know, it, it might be a regional algorithm to figure out who might be interested in learning about games in their region, but isn't targeting, um, isn't creating, uh, that might be permissible. For instance, you may decide that's permissible, but you may decide 
uh, or, or an operator may decide that's permissible use, but more um, invasive marketing that if that uh, an algorithm that uh, I don't know targets somebody who's who does show signs of a problem. Um, another permissible use that I know has come up is if if the operator is seeing problem behavior to try to get somebody help. Um, so in some ways, mm-hmm. actually mm-hmm. being. Yeah, so that's another permissible use. So, yeah. so you are, so you really are connecting it to the marketing. That was really my question. That this, I was wondering if it was also integrity and security initially. And Caitlin gave the, the good example of like money laundering and, and the use of that um, or integrity issues. But are you saying is this the genesis of this really around marketing? You know? Well, I, I will. I, again, I don't want to speak for the AG's office, but I think in their letter, part of the desire to see this was to to get us to have a for the commission and the commonwealth to have an understanding of what operators were you they were using their algorithms or ai for so that if they are using it for marketing you could make the appropriate judgment call if that's consistent with your existing marketing regs and other efforts you've made around responsible gaming. So I, I do think that's a concern that the attorney general's office has had is um, this, these algorithms may, you know, the, this kind of um, machine learning algorithm uh, work may not actually be something where we today know exactly how it's being used and this would surface it. I suppose that if it's used for surveillance and security and integrity, we'd want to make sure it was being used in a permissible fashion too, meaning an ethical, right. fair, right. non-targeted, perfect, right? Um, commissioners, what do you think? Do you want to see the language uh, that the AG, should we put that up in front of us to see about the language that seems very geared toward marketing at the end? That was why I was asking the question. <clears throat> suggested language commissioner Skinner do you want to see it yeah I think that makes sense sense. um but I think really it's all of the above to 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 your point um I'm appreciative of the the AGO's insights here um and rather than us trying to come up with the universe of what is permissible and what may not be permissible um this sounds like a good way to get this information in front of us for review um, yeah, probably to be flagged by the sports wagering division if there are any um, anomalies. Do you agree with me, though, Commissioner Skinner, that it's broader than marketing? And that was where I was struggling with it. Uh, I do. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but, but I think that's okay. I don't. I don't. Oh I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. I do too. Commissioner O'Brien. Are you, are you yeah. Saying, no, uh, I, I I agree with what Commissioner Skinner just said and what you were saying. I like the language. I mean, part of this is is you know, forces introspection too on their part, right? To be more deliberate about what they're doing with this data. And then we're gonna know too, and if we find something that we think is an unacceptable use and, or we wanna direct them to be able to use that information in a proactive way for responsible gaming and the like, I think this language gets us there. Right. Madam Chair, I'm happy to share a red line that shows the addition. That'd be great, yeah. thanks. Might need to make it a little bit bigger, please. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the red is um, yeah. is is what you see in, in mm-hmm. front of you that we added um, uh, prior to the most recent set of comments. The blue is a description of the measure the operator u- utilizes to to minimize the extent uh, to which its use of such systems promote addictive use. So. The way this sort of, this may be a little bit more marketing focused, but yeah. uh, it, it does tie into the permissible and per, impermissible uses. So uh, a use that might be um, permissible in one way, but in the hands of someone who does have uh, who, who might suffer from an addiction, um, could be a problem what this is asking for is to also see what are the internal controls you're going to put in place as an operator to make sure that there's a way to avoid the sort of machine taking over and and making a problem worse 
um, because of that. But I, I do agree that as a whole, section M or subsection M would go well beyond marketing. It could be for other AI purposes or other uses of AI. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking it was going for when I first read it, because I didn't have the blue language. And then when I heard that language, it threw me a little bit. Mishrooms, what are you thinking? Madam Chair, when I was reading through it, I, I looked at it as basically a disclosure, right, on behalf of, of the operator through their through their rules. So I, I'm perfectly fine with that. I think there has to be a larger conversation of what we do with this information once we know how the information's working. I did think to myself when I was reading it, the way AI works, right, is it's always ever changing. So perhaps we would have to even get additional information over time. But, you know, I looked at it as more of like a disclosure. And how do you feel about the um, recommended blue language that's in front of us? Because that's new from the AG's office, right? I think that I'm all for the, um, the language that our team provided and then the AG's um, office has picked up on the typo and then added that last clause, which is more directed toward marketing. Fine with that. I, I, I think it goes a little Sorry. broader than marketing. I, I think I'm okay with it. Yeah, me too. I'll ask our legal team, any concern about the phrase framing? Uh, from my perspective, Madam Chair, I, I see it uh, very similarly to how um, Commissioner Maynard sees it, that this is a disclosure. We'll find mm -hmm. out how they're using it. Um, and I also agree with what Commissioner O'Brien says, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the, the benefits of this is causing the operators, if they haven't already, and you know, they very well may have, to put down uh, in writing what, you know, what they're doing with this and have their own internal conversations of what is and isn't appropriate uses um, since they do have to disclose it. And so I don't have an issue with that. You're not um, requiring necessarily any particular measures um, to minimize and you're not banning any particular uses up front, but it gives you a chance to, to look at it. I might suggest the word may in front of promote. Um, I think a lot of operators are gonna have trouble believing that any of its practices promote addictive services, but that's just my, mm -hmm. my mind. I don't wanna diminish if it, that diminishes the AG's um, intent or if it helps it. I should, uh, Madam Chair, this may be just a good opportunity to know. We are going to, because right. one of the reasons we're holding this is that they will have another chance to, to sort of see any changes you make to it. So. Um, we can certainly run this particular point by them. Uh, uh, on its face, I don't see that as an issue. I think you could actually read that as um, a good catch-all so that somebody couldn't say, well, we, we're promote. not promoting addictive right. use, so, so we're therefore it's okay, as opposed That's, to seeing yeah. what the... I think our operators would not say that they are any practice that promotes addictive uses, so may... I think that, that was my only question. All right, thanks. That's really helpful for me. I mean, the whole conversation, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner uh, Skinner, Commissioner Maynard. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. And if I may, I'm gonna just stop sharing, Madam Chair, and we can always yeah, do that again. That was really to. helpful, thank you. Um, So if there's no further questions on that section, on that portion, I'm just gonna scroll down to the uh, other changes in 238. Um, in 238.07, um, this is on page 276, there's a few um, 
additional cross-references on, uh, is there any some information security responsibilities in the internal controls regs here, uh, but this now kind of standardizes the language we're using to refer to personally identifiable information um, and to make clear the cross-referencing to other data privacy laws. This was an important uh, ad from, from the Attorney General's office that we were happy to incorporate. Uh, similar changes on the following page, 277. Um, I, I will note there may be some places where when you do see the final, the words confidential information will need to be added if they were missed, but that, again, it's that sort of phrase of the two taken together. Um, 238.13 is on page 281. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, Entirely different issue altogether. Back to the, we're kind of killing multiple birds here. Uh, this is a, a question that's come up, as I understand it, to um, staff and the lead, internal legal team. Um, the 238.13 was intentionally supposed to be very simple and follow the complementary services, um, this, uh, tracking and disclosure requirements for uh, the gaming entities. 23K requires um, uh, a sort of monthly statement that goes to patrons. This was in the statute um, for, um, for any complimentary services or, or, or goods, uh, including, I think, um, and again, Todd or, or Caitlin, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, including sort of a, a status of how you, you know, what you played or when you played in the past month. 23N does not have that requirement. And um, I think on further reflection, um, staff and legal's recommendation is that it's not necessary. And in fact, in a context where um, one could get could engage in sports wagering just by picking up their phone as opposed to having to drive to a gaming facility, there actually may be an unintended consequence of sending someone a monthly invoice uh, to say, here's what's been happening with your account. Um, if you're not using it, it sort of reminds you that you, you might have one. So the suggestion is um, everything else in terms of internal controls around complementary services, disclosing what's been given, tracking, et cetera, for record keeping stays in place, but not the sending out of monthly invoices uh, to um, patrons. So Mina, can I ask, is, in, is part of that conversation, was Mark and his team part of that conversation? And do they agree that it's better to not send those out? Um, I'll defer to Todd and Caitlin on that. I, I so this will, we kind of had this conversation perhaps in a in a serial way. Todd or Caitlin, I don't know if you know if Mark was part of that. Uh, I am I am not sure, but we can absolutely circle up with him and and get his take on that before filing. And if if he disagrees with this, um, yeah. come back to the commission. <laughs> Yeah, if he disagrees, I'd want to have a deeper conversation, but if he's yeah. of the same mind, I'm, I'm fine with it. Any other questions on, on that section? Okay. Um, on page 284, there's a small addition um, about uh, disclosure um, to, this was about disclosure of confidential information um, uh, provided in, for the purpose of investigating or, pre or preventing any inappropriate conduct. Um, we had already had a reference here to disclosures to sports governing bodies or, or operators. Um, we had understood that uh, implicitly it was no means uh, intended to override a player's association's rights to information, but the player's associations did ask uh, specifically for, for a reference to it. Their concern is they want to make sure that they have, um, you know, the operator, uh, you know, isn't just giving the information to the governing body, especially if it's, if it involves player misconduct or alleged player misconduct um, in that case. So that, that was added there. Um, following page, again, a few sort of cleanup edits to use to define pers uh, personally identifiable information and confidential information. 
and a couple more of those, but let me just see the next place where we may need to discuss. Um, this is 238.35 um, on page 299. Um, we removed uh, a section, um, and, and for reference, you'd need to go to page before it to see what it is. Um, there were concerns, I think, as, as once you know, we start to see this in action, um, that there might be confusion or too much discretion uh, as to when uh, a bet could be canceled for human error uh, without prior notice to the commission and an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, so the recommendation was to move uh, subsection I essentially out of the category of times when a bet could be canceled uh, or wager, excuse me, could be canceled um, automatically or without further request of the commission by an operator, which are generally a easily objective measurable things, uh, an event is canceled, uh, a change in venue, um, things like that. Whereas I had a little bit more uh, potential judgment calls in it. So the recommendation is to take that out of, uh, of subsection one, um, and it would still be captured, although no new language is needed in the all other circumstances in subsection two. So it's not that it could never happen, but it would require um, a request of the commission to cancel when it, in, in those cases. And keep in mind that this is cancellation by the operator having a reasonable basis uh, as opposed to um, if the, the bet um, it, you know, clearly has, um, when the, if the patron requests the cancellation or void because they made a, an error that still stays under subsection one. Nina, I may, Madam Chair, if I may, um, I may be asking a dumb question, but how does this interact with um, 24703 subsection 11? Uh, not, not a dumb question at all. Uh, Mr. Maynard, because um, we will talk about uh, how this interacts with 247 and 248. There'll be, there's a cross-reference back to 238.35, and that's, that will be one of the updates, so. All right, um, okay, I'll wait. Yeah. Hey, so, fantastic. Sorry, um, Commissioner Maynard, did you say 247.11? It's on page 315 in the packet, subsection 11. Yeah, so we can talk about it now because that's the substantive issue is really there. Um, so the if you go to page 315, you'll see new language inserted. Um, there's sort of two pieces to it. Um, the, the new language inserted, I'm actually looking for, actually, if you go first to 312, sorry, mm -hmm. that's, that's where you want to go first. 312 uh, requires one of the things now to be in in-house um, wagering rules, um, how the operator will cancel or void sports wagers in accordance with 238, as opposed to for obvious errors. So that sort of takes out the obvious errors piece. And Commissioner Maynard, your question I think is a, a sort of second issue on 315, which has to do with parlays. Um, the the answer is that house rules may have uh, in them, and I believe some do, some don't is my understanding, uh, the ability for the sports uh, operator to maintain the, the bet, you know, to not cancel a bet or to cancel it depending on, on their house rules, if one leg of a parlay um, is, is itself canceled. However, those would still be uh, in objective circumstances. So let's say it's a multi-game parlay and one of the games gets rained out. It's you know, during baseball season, one of the games gets rained out. The operator may in their house rules have, uh, have said, if that happens, the parlay stays in place or they might say it does not. But that should just, that what, what 247 will do is to say, you just have to be clear up front about that in, in your house rules. Um, if you're going to cancel only the portion 
that's there. How it interacts with the provision we were just talking about is um, a, a little less direct, but it wouldn't be considered an obvious error. And, and if, if it, what the what the operator can't do is determine that well no one would have meant to do this parlay because it doesn't make sense anymore because of the rain out so I'm canceling it um, they just have to follow their their explicit objective house rules as opposed to making that judgment call got it and Sterl, I don't know if you I saw you pop in I don't know if you had anything else to add on that piece but no, that was that was very good. Oh, thank you. Oh, um, <laughs> so, Sterl, that does mean affirmative that they need to affirmatively address it one way or another. Yes, uh, we, when we review their house rules, we looked at the address. Uh, um, what happens when avoided leg of a parlay? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions on, uh, so we're back onto page 299, just for reference. Um, so back, I'm sorry, to which page? Uh, 299. Yeah, thank you. And when you said it's all encapsulated in section two, section two is untouched, right? Section two is untouched. That's really any other circumstance where the operator wants to, uh, would like to cancel a wager and has to ask, ask to do so. Yeah. If there's nothing further, um, I'll keep going to, so on page uh, 303, just uh, more of the cross-referencing to data privacy and, and the and the series of, of statutes and regs there. Um, same again on 304. Um, and then on 305, uh, this language, so in, in E, the first change is just uh, make, using the defined term. The second larger change is at the suggestion of the Attorney General's office from their March comments, not the most recent ones. Um, this has to do with the uh, use of uh, personal confidential information, um, sort of the permission to use data, uh, personal data and personal information. Um, and the attorney general's office suggested, and I think this is consistent with some of their other regulations, or at least their, their, the best practices they recommend, that authorization for use has to be clear uh, and conspicuous and receive apart from other agreement or approval. Um, I apologize, I don't have the states off the top of my head, but I do know that there's at least one or two other states that require the same. And essentially it's not, so when you sign up to, the, to, to sign up your account, you have to also, if you're going to acknowledge for um, use of data, it has to be um, separately acknowledged. Um, and most of the other language here is just details on what doesn't uh, count. So acceptance of broad terms is not um, simply hovering over an authorization or keeping it open for a certain time. You have to affirmatively say that your data can be used. So this is a, 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 a practice that AG recommended as a, as a way to further secure personal information and data. Questions on that, commissioners? I guess we're all set there. Yes, and I, um, one um, suggestion we did get um, just the other, this was, this came in, I guess, yesterday uh, from the Attorney General's office. Um, and we can talk about how to handle these particular, this kind of suggestion. Uh, they did suggest that perhaps 23845 um, to basically after I see on this page, same page, uh, excuse me, prior page 304, the last red line where it says 205 CMR 2XX, the Attorney General's office um, would suggest taking all of the remaining language uh, into 
the data privacy reg instead of the internal controls reg. So just the language we just talked about on 305 and, and the A through E. Um, I think this is more of a placement or repetition piece. Uh, my suggestion for the moment uh, would be, uh, I think because the internal controls regs kind of function to tell you what to put in the controls, and the data privacy regs may be what, the, what an individual patron who's worried about an issue might open up, that it actually may be preferable to have it in both um, would be our recommendation. Uh, in our conversation that we plan to have with the Attorney General's office, we'll see if they see any major flaws with that thinking, but I, my preference would be to keep it in both places. One for really the operators and Sterl and, and Bruce's team as they're going through internal controls to know that it's there, and one for the, uh, for the public to be able to see what their rights are with respect to data usage. I don't know if any, any reactions to that. That would be fine with me. Yeah, I agree with you. I think both. <clears throat> Thank you, you Sorry about Jerry. I think, I think that um, everyone's in agreement with that. Great. Okay. Um, so with that, um, I can move on to 247, if that's okay. Or would you rather pause on these two and Take those off and take the other two separately. I think you'd like us to to wait and hold on on the vote, so we'll proceed, right, commissioners? Okay, two forty seven. Yes. In that case, uh, we will we'll march onward, and they are getting shorter as we go on. I promise. So, um, two forty seven. Uh, there are not many changes here. We actually already talked about two of the more significant ones on page three twelve the cross-reference for uh, the po operator's policy for canceling or avoiding sports wagers is now in accordance with 205 CMR 238.35, as opposed to for obvious errors, since that's not an available option, uh, at least without asking um, initially. Um, to the next change is the one we discussed on 315 that uh, Commissioner Maynard um, pointed, to, pointed to, that's with the, the parlay rule. Um, that would be changing there. Um, and then I'm just trying to see if there's any. Um, again, on page 323, this is another you know, tying back to 235 and making sure that's correct. This is uh, sports wagering operators canceling, again, of, of, of uh, any wagers. Um, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the notification piece and, and, and how that works? Because I do see that there have been some changes about. So I see that the language is used must immediately cancel an unauthorized or prohibited sporting event. Back to 11, but, but it's also. Can you say where you are, though, Jordan, please? I'm back into 11. I'm back into 11. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, I apologize, sorry. We, the, we the, the page, I'm back on 11. Yes, on section yeah. 11 and page So not the actual uh, language. 315. That, looking at the language, not that was changed, Mina, you know, the, the parlay language, but the unchanged language. Yes. Is the it's immediate a little bit cancel, the yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, I, I, Commissioner Maynard, I should have gone over that and I have forgotten that we didn't talk about that piece of it. Um, the suggestion there is um, there was a concern um, that if the operator does canceling and refunding, uh, they may not, the way the language read before um, suggested that you could wait until after you're refunded to note that there was a cancellation and the desire after, again, with, with a bit more lived experience now was for the commission to find out when bets are canceled. Um, and if the refund isn't you know, simultaneous to find out again, that to make sure that it's been refunded. So that's a- I, I think Commissioner Maynard is raising um, an issue that we probably need to pause briefly on. Um, I need a quick clarification with the legal on that. Um, can we pause and I can make a call? Uh, Todd, could you call me, please? 
Could we, uh, Madam Chair, could we identify the, the issue? Is it appropriate? To well, I think, it, yes, I think um, if I'm correct, I just want, it's, it may, I don't want to raise an issue if I'm wrong completely okay. unnecessarily. Do you mind if I just pause for a quick one minute call with legal? Um, thanks, no. uh, we'll reconvene. And then if it is, then I'll, I'll share a little bit more, Commissioner Skinner. But if I say something and I'm just completely wrong, it would be an unfair. All right, um, we'll return in five minutes at, um, at 2.55, thanks.
Thanks, Dave. Good to go. Great, we had a very brief um, break, but I will um, just as best practice uh, when everybody comes on, i do a quick roll call again once everybody arrives. Um, Oh, here we are. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Commissioner Hill, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Commissioner Skinner, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, Commissioner Maynard. Good afternoon. And, and thanks everyone, you know, at any point in time, um, any commissioner can pause if they want to just get some counsel. And I, um, as I was thinking about our review of this particular provision, I did need to check in with um, General Counsel and, and um, the Deputy General Counsel and Monahan joined uh, the conversation. So thank you for, um, for that and, and the quick break, everyone. So uh, after a conversation with the chair and out of an abundance of caution, we would advise holding uh, the commission's conversation on this particular section 247.0311 until after uh, some of the current uh, deliberations on potential non-compliance events are closed, just because discussions could um, potentially get into that territory. So we can just hold this, if it, if it works for the commission, we'll hold this particular provision and bring this back once deliberations are closed. Commissioners, does that make sense to you? Are you okay with that? I am, but are we gonna have a tight window? <laughs> are we gonna have others that come up? Are we gonna have a small window to come back and adjudicate and move on? We'll we take a, a it could be tight. We'll take a look at the <laughs> time. <laughs> we'll take a look at timing and um, make but, it work. I okay. think so. We need to get those deliberations done. So this is a, a good, uh, we'll have um, Trudy and Grace work their magic, okay? Commissioner Maynard, are you all set with that? I am I'm perfectly happy to table the conversation, but like Commissioner O'Brien said, I do want to revisit this soon. And um, you know, to be clear, any modifications in any reg does not have anything to do with whatever's come before us and the facts and circumstances that have already presented themselves. And, and there's been a change in this already, but um, I would like to get it sooner rather than later. Um, okay. Madam Chair, just for my clarification, um, since so we can help prepare the, the next draft of this, um, we're only speaking about the last sentence, I take it, um, here, the sports waging operator must notify, correct? Or is that, or the whole change in section 11? I think it's related to the first sentence also. Sorry to interrupt. That's right. I'll turn yep. to Caitlin on that. Yeah, I would suggest just uh, tabling this whole paragraph. Um, okay. Subsection 11. All right. Thank you. That will, and, and I agree absolutely with Commissioner Maynard, and, and that was certainly the point that the uh, council raised as well. Uh, it does allow us to be more transparent with our discussion if we just hold briefly. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, that, that break actually uh, gave me the opportunity to to note that we should stay on page, uh, top of page 316 for a change. Okay. Um, so- um, oh, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, so this is uh, one of two comments we'll address today. And actually the other one is in 238, which I will address, we're gonna go back to at the end because it's a new section in 238. Uh, but this one is in 247. Uh, we had added the language, uh, the integrity, health or welfare of athletes as one of the reasons that a wager may be canceled for good cause. Again, this was at the behest of this uh, Players Association, the idea being that if there is, um, to use an example, internet chatter that um, a player is being harassed or accosted uh, with respect to a particular event um, that's being wagered on because their performance might lead to a certain outcome on a wager, um, they may end up requesting uh, 
that there not be wages permitted on that to kind of take the temperature off. Um, again, this is not, uh, it's not the end all and be all, it's not just a request, there's a whole process and the governing bodies have always had this ability, but it adds in other, the reasons to going beyond just the integrity of this of the activity to the integrity, health or welfare of the athlete. Um, after this draft was put in the agenda, we did receive slightly different wording um, as a subsection E, rather than doing this change in D, simply adding subsection E may undermine player safety or the safety of players' families um, as, as an alternative. Um, the concept is the same, um, but the, the idea is to, to be able to, to deal with that kind of situation if it comes up. Do you want to comment after integrity? Uh, I I would, although I'm in, um, also because I'm willing to take just uh, what the players' association offered. It would you would actually undo this change and add a subsection E that would say may yeah. undermine player safety or safety of their families. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sorry. I think this was a big issue for them. Yeah. Um, and not only did they discuss it with us via a letter, but they followed up with us a couple of the commission, not with us, but with the commission staff. Um, I'd be okay with adding the new section, Mina. Got it. No, I agree. Kept coming up over and over. And we have seen too many things happen lately over the mm -hmm. last couple of years, so I think it's appropriate. Thank you. So we will make sure that's in the. So it's not added on. It's a substitute. Got it. It will be a substitute as a sub subsection E. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next edit is in page three twenty three. Um, if that is, unless that is part of what we should not discuss. So I just want to be clear about that. Is that okay, Caitlin? Okay. This is fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is just another cross reference to. to uh, 238.35 um, for how, how bets are canceled. 324, uh, this is a couple more comments uh, from the last round of edits from the Attorney General's office um, in section 247.09 about promotional offers. Um, the um, last edition here is the conditions um, this is in terms of what must be documented uh, in record keeping for, by the operator for promotional offers, um, conditions or circumstances under which the uh, promotion is displayed, uh, really to round out how it was advertised. So this would be captured in part by 256, but uh, sort of a belts and suspenders to make sure that how, how promotional offers are, are advertised or shown to a patron um, are also recorded or kept in, kept a, there's a record kept of them, excuse me. Um, subsection two has a few uh, suggested edits uh, drawn from comments from the attorney general's office uh, using the phrase clearly and conspicuously in the disclosure of terms, uh, which was always the intent, but just to be uh, slight rewording from, from where we're before. Um, the that uh, subsection sub subsection B, I guess, uh, shall provide full disclosure before anything of value is exchanged. Again, uh, that was always the intent, but made a little bit clearer. Um, uh, number three, this will actually be this is one we wanted to discuss a little bit further with the AG's office. They suggested taking the 90 days to down to 30 days. Uh, my understanding of this is a concern that promotional offers that get stale may be harder to track or harder to, you know, to fulfill. Uh, we want to talk with them and just make sure we understand this before recommending shortening, uh, be especially because in this particular field, um, wagers may be made pretty far ahead of when an event happens. Um, I, that's something that, for instance, uh, on parlays or a, a longer term prediction um, wager might factor into. So I just want to make sure we understand that. So we are 
kind of holding that one for further discussion as well, whether to short it from 90 days. The last two in this section, yep, the last two in, in this section are uh, also the suggestion of the Attorney General's office. Um, four would essentially prohibit a promotional offer based on referrals um, uh, as, as a sort of referral bonus as a promotional offer. And um, five uh, is a item that would have been true, but again, given that these uh, regulations are both public facing and operator facing, a reminder that uh, promotional offers have to comply not only with th this section, but all other uh, provisions of law, including everything in, in certainly your regulations, but also the consumer protection regulations. Um, this is a, a bit of a savings clause. So um, again, it's a little different than advertising. When we talked about some advertising, I think we tried to stay very broad uh, because those were that's just general advertising as opposed to particular promotional offers, which is what's an issue. So any questions on all of those? Just I mean, out of curiosity, the provided that 940 CMR and then the series of subtitles, what is that? Um, it is part of the retail advertising regulations and th those particular carve outs came from the attorney general's office. Um, I don't have them right in front of, him, of me, C Commissioner O'Brien, but they were provisions that they just want to make clear probably wouldn't make sense in the sports wagering okay. uh, arena so that they, they didn't want to have a challenge to, you know, to that piece of it. They, they were, they're very clear that they don't believe these to apply in this. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, And I believe that's it for 247. If I may, I will take up 248. It begins on page 329. Um, uh, page 250, again, um, changes to refer to personally identifiable information. Um, there was a request from the attorney general's office, a suggestion, I should say that they have a, a telephone number be added for as a way, something the operator collects for the patron, um, which um, I think is just another measure to, to ensure security um, and to, to have a sort of another point of contact. Um, Couple of other places again where we use that information, we use a, a sort of cleanup edits. Um, the uh, edit on page 331 under item 3H um, is a requirement that basically allows for verification that the person using the account is using their own debit card, um, not somebody else's. Uh, this is consistent with other regs you have that you, you may only set up an account for yourself, but that's that was a, the intent there. Um, 331, uh, sorry, th bottom of 330 first, very small edit, just moving words around slightly for uh, a little bit of clarity. As I know there was a slight, uh, the AG's concern was the Mm -hmm. read that it would be their social security number at the time and as opposed to the whole thing at the time. Um, uh, section 332, uh, again, another suggestion is to utilize identity uh, authentication questions uh, at, that, at the time of account establishment. This is on page 332 and 24804. Um, I'm just making sure I'm not missing any new comments, but. I think so. Uh, again, uh, bottom of 333, um, again, several changes just to, to update for confidential personal identifiable information. So it's a lot, it looks like a lot of changes, but it's actually mostly capitalization. Um, Mina, on, on just subsection four on 332. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess 
I guess I, I was just thrown off by the comma structure. Got it. Awesome. Um, then the next change uh, that we should discuss um, is 248.16. Um, okay. uh, sorry, on page 338. Thank you. Um, so there was a, the suggestion was, again, to make clear that um, responsible gaming limits be clearly and conspicuously posted for, uh, so that's, that's included here. Um, we included this with respect to the first time an account is set up or the first time a, a deposit is made into the account um, and the first time, uh, there's a missing word there, I apologize, places a wager from the account. Um, the attorney general's office would actually, um, their, their one place where we didn't pick up the edit is uh, rather than say the first time a patron makes a, an, a deposit would be each time uh, a patron makes a deposit. I think that's a policy judgment for the commission, whether to require re-notification of responsible gaming limits at that point uh, for every, for every uh, deposit not every wager, but every deposit. So I, I don't know if there's any feedback on that at this point. I guess mine would be the same I had before in terms of Mark's team. Do they have thoughts on whether it's helpful or harmful to send notifications out in that circumstance? Um, so Commissioner O'Brien, this is one of the comments we received just yesterday. So we can certainly discuss it with Mark. We haven't had the opportunity yet. Okay. Um, other than that, and of course, fixing a uh, wager here, um, that, that should, that's it for this one. Here we are. Um, before we take, we discuss how to proceed with all four, I do want to just note one other section in the sports wagering internal controls that was suggested by the Players Association as an additional section. Um, and so I will, um, I'm going to describe this. It's, it's a bit longer and I'm not sure that we have, uh, unless I can get it up on the screen if, if you give me one second. Um, the, the issue here has to do with, um, within the internal controls, um, they, the sports, the players associations have asked for a section called deference to collectively bargained agreements. And the provision would essentially require that um, an operator, well, and the commission as well, consider and where possible give deference to rules collectively negotiated between a league and, its, and the players association, governing player safety, misuse of biometric data, coordination with injury in other states, uh, investigation of, of gambling related charge involving professional athlete. Um, so it's, uh, I, again, we just received these, um, I think at the end of last week um, and our team only had a chance to look at them yesterday. Uh, we'd like to, since we are likely to revisit these regs anyway, discuss this at that point. I'll put it up on the screen just to see if there's any initial feedback. Um, the concern, I, th I believe, in our conversation with the Players Association is they just want to make crystal clear that nothing in these regulations um, would upend uh, negotiated for agreements with governing bodies. Um, I understand the concern. I don't think there's uh, much reason to fear that it would, um, as between the governing bodies and, and the um, the players associations, you don't regulate, um, you don't really regulate that relationship or really the, the performance of sports or the um, even the, the gameplay. What you regulate is, is simply wagering on it. Um, and elsewhere, if you recall, when we talked about discipline or when we talked about um, how information would be shared with players uh, associations, um, so, and excuse me, in governing bodies, we also made it clear that we weren't trying to get in the middle of what happens uh, if a player 
is supposed to be suspended or suspended with or without pay or whatever else it might be fined. That's not an, up to the commission as, as respects to what's under their collective bargaining agreement. That would be with respect to the governing body. Um, so I think there's reasons not to insert this, um, but I, you know, again, the, the commission um, may want to review this uh, more closely. So and, and since we just got it, we didn't want to um, go too far. I, I'm going to try to share my screen. The only issue is we have this in a very small form. So I'm going to try to zoom in on all the way uh, if I can. Okay. Uh, this was a comment in a PDF. So I don't know if I can make this okay. any bigger than that, but um, quite easily. So let's see if we do this. Uh, not, not really. Everything else gets bigger but that. So I'm not sure that helps, but that's the gist of the provision that would be added. Um, Madam Chair, I'll defer to you if you want to hold this for now for a future conversation or if there any if there's any feedback. We did receive them in our own um, emails. So you, you did. Can, yeah. Um, if you read it out loud, it might. Did everybody sure. have a chance to? To look. So I, I can certainly read out loud. It's in the body of the email as well. Um, oh. There just wasn't a very easy way I can and, share that either. And can you just, um, it's 248, again, the subsection, please. Sorry, it's 230, it would be a new 238.51. It would be a new added that's section. That's what, okay. Yeah. And yeah. so they would de define covered persons and really to yeah. mean everyone affiliated with the league. Um, um, or with a sport, um, including umpires, referees, medical professionals, et cetera. And then I would say, unless otherwise described in law or regulation on any charge involving the conduct of a professional athlete, the commission shall consider and where possible give deference to rules collectively negotiated between a league and its players association governing player safety, misuse of personal biometric data, coordination with inquiries in other states and the investigation and resolution of a gambling related charge involving a professional athlete. Um, so essentially, uh, the, the concerns I have with the language just on its face, um, one is it does leave open when is a law, another law or regulation in place. I, I also think it suggests maybe more involvement on the part of the commission than the commission uh, really has. Um, so for instance, if someone is uh, accused, uh, an athlete uh, does an endorsement deal, let's say that violates 256 um, and you decide to take disciplinary action under 232, um, you would be treating them as an individual who should or should not, um, should be licensed or who has violated your regulations, 205 CMR. Uh, you would not at that point be weighing in at all on whether that person ought to be fined by their league uh, or ought to be suspended by their league or anything else. That's sort of on the discipline side. So that's that's why one reason I, I don't see a need there. With respect to player safety or misuse of biometric data, um, the player safety issues we talked about a little bit uh, already, uh, but to the extent, for instance, uh, a collective bargaining agreement requires um, a governing body to use or not use biometric data in a particular way, the contractual relationship would be between the athletes and their, and their governing body. Um, and so again, it, there's not really a role for the commission to play other than to get the information from the governing bodies. And since you are also, we did add provisions to make sure players associations are adequately you know, at the table and, and getting information when needed. Um, if there's an objection to it, that may be something you take into account before you decide whether that uh, league data is appropriate to use uh, with reference perhaps to the collective bargaining agreement, but ultimately uh, uh, there, I just, the sort of, again, 24 hour was worth of reaction to this, not then there may be some further thought on it. I, I do wonder if we would need to think a little bit more about um, any concerns of the commission um, being asked to arbitrate with a small a disputes mm -hmm. over what, what a collective bargaining agreement means, which is not 
something you're really equipped to do or, or, or tasked to do in your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, my first thought, my first inclination is that we would not look at adding this to our regulation at this point. And Mina, I don't know if you can look for us to other jurisdictions, but I'm not so sure that any jurisdiction would adopt such language. I think it's out of our ballywick, as they say. Yeah. Uh, I am not aware of any that ha has it. Uh, when we were pointed to other jurisdictions in the past around this, they might have had reservation clauses to say that you know, ultimate disclosure obligations might be governed by collective bargaining, but that's about as far as it went, which is similar to what we have already. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Are we in agreement with Commissioner Hill? Um, in that case, um, Madam Chair, uh, that email, just for reference, also had a reference to Section 152 of your regs. That will be coming before you at, on a later date, so I'm not going to discuss that now. Um, and we are trying to, to incorporate the concept, if not the exact language, into those regs. Um, that was a concern about player safety um, as well. Right. So we've been able to be quite responsive overall. To Correct. The yeah. And Commissioner Hill, you're, you're nodding your head with that. You feel the same way, right? Okay. Um, so with that, I think we've wrapped up uh, these four regulations. Um, and uh, the, given that there are some outstanding issues, um, Uh, you certainly could take a vote to accept them as modified today, um, but we will uh, try before, uh, and then Caitlin and Todd and Carrie, I, I don't know how, if you'd want to proceed that way, and, and then we, we'll prepare clean drafts just to make sure everything looks in order, um, as well as provide any other updates based on um, the conversation with the Attorney General's office on the privacy rec. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful um, if we could get a vote you know, on the, on the commission's consensus on these four today, uh, what we'll do is at a later date in the near future, bring them back. Um, and it, we can highlight at that point, any additional, hopefully minor revisions, but then we don't have to sort of walk through it all again and, and refresh everyone's recollection. Um, also because, you know, at the next few meetings, um, I know we're going to have a bunch of regs, so want to be cognizant of time. So yes, if, if the commission is amenable a vote on those four would be helpful before we move on to 256. And we would just have to ex um, address that subsection 11. In our right. There are a couple of things we talked about today where we said, you know, if Mark has a difference of opinion or that, that particular subsection you're referencing, Chair, um, we'll bring those back. So. Well, we have our notes to bring those back when we come back um, a second time on these. You will see the, what I will say to you today is even if you vote on them today, you're gonna to see them again for That's a right. final review before we file. Does that make everybody more comfortable about the timing issue? Okay. So do I have a motion on these first four, then we'll go back to the... Um... Did we, did we want to do them separate, Madam Chair, or did we want to just do a very big motion? If you're comfortable doing a big motion, does that work for, or we have to do the business statement seat as well, so what works best for you, legal? Individual votes? I always like individual votes. I know Individual is a little cleaner. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner Hill, let's go for the beginning uh, 138. So Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement and the draft 205 CMR 138 as included in the commissioner's packet and discussed here today. I move that the staff be authorized to take the steps necessary to file the required documentation with the Secretary of the Commonwealth by emergency and thereafter to begin the regulation promulgation process relative to this regulation. I further move that the staff be authorized to modify chapter or section numbers or titles 
to file additional regulation sections as reserved or to make any other administrative changes as necessary to execute the regulation promulgation process. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Hill? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Skinner? Aye. And Commissioner Maynard? Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero. Uh, <clears throat> Before we get started on 238, is that where there was at least a request to address, uh, raise um, a question for Director Vander Linden? Was it 238 or 247? 238, right? There, there were one in each, I believe. One in each, yeah. yeah. So we were right both. Okay, thank you. Okay, on 238, do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the small business impact statement in the draft 205 CMR 238 as included in the Commissioner's packet, but only to the extent reflected in discussions here today. I, I further move that staff be authorized to take the steps necessary to file the required documentation with the Secretary of the Commonwealth by emergency and thereafter to begin the regulation promulgation process relative to this regulation. I further move that staff shall be authorized to modify chapter or section numbers or titles to file additional regulation sections as reserved or to make any other administrative changes as necessary to execute the regulation promulgation process. Second. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. All right, then um, 247, that would be both, uh, I would address that section 11, as well as clarification from Director Vanderland. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. 247. Sure, thank you. Uh, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement and draft of 205 CMR 247 as included in the commissioner's packet and specifically as uh, limited to our discussions here today. And further that staff be authorized to take the steps necessary to file the required documentation with the secretary of the Commonwealth by emergency and thereafter and begin the regulation promulgation process relative to this regulation. Further move staff be authorized to modify chapter section numbers or titles or file additional regulation sections as reserved or make any other administrative changes as necessary to execute the regulation promulgation process. Second. Questions, edits? Okay. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Uh, uh, Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Aye. And I vote yes, so 5-0. All right, uh, 248. I move, I move that the commission approve the small business impact statement in the draft 205 CMR 248 as included in the commissioner's packet and specifically um, as limited to our discussion here today. I move that the staff be authorized to take the steps necessary to file the required documentation with the Secretary of the Commonwealth by emergency and thereafter to begin the regulation promulgation process relative to this regulation. I further move that staff shall be authorized to modify chapter or section numbers or titles to file additional regulation sections as reserved or to make any other administrative changes as necessary to execute the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any questions, edits? Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes, five zero. Thank you, Mina. Thank you for getting us through that. And uh, now we have that last reg that is right at the end of our document. Correct. And uh, this, this one uh, should be fairly quick. And I believe uh, 
Uh, again, I'll look to the rest of the legal team. We're not actually asking for a vote on this one today because there may be some, some other things we want to think about with 256 before voting on it again. Uh, but this is a uh, just a small oversight. Uh, I apologize, I, I think it was my oversight. Uh, we had um, discussed removing the word branding, not in ev every location, but in some locations where it did make sense to require that a logo, for instance, be accompanied by all of the surrounding messaging required for uh, responsible gaming and under uh, prohibitions on underage gaming, et cetera. Uh, it was called to our attention that 256.051 uh, inadvertently still had the word branding. We went back and checked for all other uses. They all fit except this one. Um, so this, um, um, change would simply take out branding as part of the requirement to show, to say that tw uh, per patrons, excuse me, under 21 years of age or older um, cannot participate. Uh, I used the example, I believe, when I shared this draft of, you know, uh, the signs, uh, I can think of at least two operators that advertise on the green monster. Um, and that was not the intent, was not to include the messaging there. Um, so, I think all we're looking for today is a consensus that you agree with our intent and perhaps procedurally, and Caitlin, I, I see you, you might jump in. I'll, I'll defer to you procedurally on how to do that, but um, per, perhaps as a, as a waiver. But I, I think, so one of the things as, as you can probably tell um, is that we're now dealing with when we change a reg, it kind of locks it up for two to three months. Um, and so what, what we would suggest doing here is just uh, voting on this particular subsection of the reg, voting on the amendment to this particular subsection. So it will sort of lock up this subsection. Um, that being, let me open it up, 256.05. But to the extent there are other advertising related issues and other sections we wanna bring back, we can do that separately. Um, so the long and short of it is, I think it would be helpful to have a vote on this. We will file this. We will get this started through the, the process, but the rest of advertising will remain open and, well, it's, it's finished, but uh, 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 we'll be able to, to make modifications if necessary going forward. Does that make sense? Well, I think it's important that we, we clarify this issue. Commissioner Brian, you've got to- Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious as to why branding is being removed from this use section? Um, so there's, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, this particular section requires a disclosure that any, uh, any of the listed categories of advertising um, disclose that it, it has to be 21 plus. Um, right. In trying to distinguish the dis what these different types of advertising mean, we've used branding to um, throughout to really refer to when a logo appears uh, without mm -hmm. any, as, as I think one of the operators put, any call to action. It doesn't necessarily tell you what the logo means or where the website is other than just the name of the entity. So to use a generic one, um, you know, a Coca-Cola logo would be branding as opposed to drink Coca-Cola or, or getting, you know, here's, here's what you should enjoy about this. Um, yeah, I guess so, my... My conundrum with that, particularly when it comes to the youth, however, is this isn't Coca-Cola, you know? This is something they cannot use. So the, the, having a bet MGM or a, a bar stool have something on it that says must be 21 plus, to me, I think is appropriate. I think we did vote on this before we had this discussion. Yeah, I mean, so I thought- No, we decided... no, we had the discussion to exclude branding, that's why. Well, um, well, I guess- <laughs> Maybe I guess this, I'm glad yeah. that people are afraid. I'm, I'm troubled by the idea that you would see images, the purpose of which is to perpetuate sort of brand loyalty and affinity and not have something that just says even a 21 plus, um, not necessarily an RG message, but the reiterating that it's a 21 plus. So, um, what I just said was that any additional information on that? Somebody, I'm not sure if that's meant, is that, um, I'm sorry, if somebody was speaking on that, I couldn't tell who was speaking just now. I think Karen said something. Oh, Karen, you were, um, I couldn't, I couldn't see who was speaking, oh. my apologies. No, no, Could I just, you say it again, please? 
I was just saying that I think Crystal had uh, flagged it and had been working on this for the sports radio division, so might have some uh, additional information. Yeah, your audio is just a slightly off, Karen, just so you know, um, which is interesting. It goes around. You're not in, Kathy, so it has to migrate down to Karen's office. <laughs> I know, I know. Wiggle. Somebody else said that there's something in there. It was you, Karen, Eileen, that you said. No, me, yeah. Me. I have yeah. gremlins in my email. Um, I can offer a little bit of context if you want. I think um, that, and from the conversation before, a, maybe a better clarifier here of why it's not just the advertising piece, it's t-shirts, letterhead. When you include branding, the operators now have to, on a letterhead or, or a business card, a t-shirt or, you know, coaster, anything that's just logo based would now have to have that branding. And in other industries, even Anheuser-Busch, you know, doesn't have to put must be 21 plus under theirs. So it's, um, I think it just kind of brings it in line with that, but that was the context from before. Madam Chair, yes. if I may. The way I'm looking at this, Commissioner O'Brien, I've thought a lot about this too, um, is when you add the advertisement piece to it, then you've really got the, you know, the issue. But, you know, I'm thinking of, I, you know, I love Sam Adams, right? And I do look at the coasters when I'm at the Sam Adams and, you know, they don't, you know, that it doesn't have all the disclosures that they do in, in some of their advertisements. And so that's how I'm trying to compartmentalize this. I don't know if that helps or hurts, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I hear you. And I guess what I'm struggling with is even in the example that Crystal just gave of, you know, a coaster that's probably going to be in a bar or, you know, so the likelihood of it being something that is an image or a branding impact on an under 21 is already by the nature of it contained. Uh, I guess what I'm struggling with is, you know, you know, the bed MGM logo or the MGM logo at, at on the green monster. And you've got kids seeing that at the football game at the baseball game. I, it's, it's I, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's some other way of so, making so sure we're we just, protecting that impact. Um, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt Commissioner O'Brien. Um, mm -hmm. I, I anticipated incorrectly. Um, it might be helpful because this piece of the rag is kind of just taken separately. But what we are talking about is inserting responsible gaming language, correct? And um, 21 plus, yeah, would have to but, be on it. Well, but it, what would be the yeah, So just, we're taking branding out from the requirement to say must be 21 plus on it. It would be more than that, right? Didn't we sort of define what that responsible gaming messaging must be and it included things like the logo, DPH uh, logo? No, but this, this subsection only says you shall have, you know, you shall say patrons must be 21 plus or older to participate. It's it's restricting itself to that line. Okay, so not sort of the that, that's what added. I wanted to add. Yeah, so it's when just the it. shall state language, yeah. and not anything else. Right. So um, to Commissioner Maynard's point, Anna, let's say um, we have one of our operators have a t-shirt with just the, the name of it. What mm -hmm. you're saying is that they would have to add that language. <clears throat> Branding, Commissioner O'Brien, if they're walking down the street with it, that they're gonna have to include that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering, so I, I'm, and I'm drawing a distinction, Commissioner Mayor, like you were saying on certain things versus branding in, in environments where, to me, it's different than you see an adult wearing a t-shirt that's got that on it. They chose to put on, they're walking around and you're on the street versus they're almost advertising by the nature of how they're putting up the branding mark. And, and I would like to see a way that there's got to be something I'm like, you got to be a reminder that it's 21 plus in that context, as opposed to um, the marketing paraphernalia that Crystal described. 
So Commissioner O'Brien, just for completeness on this, the rest of this section, I just want to be clear, we're not proposing to take a branding mm -hmm. for provisions um, where there might be uh, the target audience. It certainly can't direct it right. at folks under 21. So the just to be clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and exactly. Yep. So I, yep. uh, no, I know. Yep. yep. I hear you. And then my other question is, is it in line with the casinos, with the gaming piece too, right? Like if I'm wearing mm -hmm. an MGM shirt, right? So I, yeah, I would want to be yeah. fair there too. Yeah, it's it's a it's a part that when I realized it was on the green monster, I had the same I, I had the same reaction to it in terms of saying, geez, you could have little league day where they're all filing in the stadium and then you're branding something this sort of subliminal messaging. I'm gonna be the devil's advocate though, and say they're gonna be sitting next to a beer too. Mm -hmm. You know, a glass of beer, not one that has any, you know, it's, they're gonna be, you know, sitting next to someone who may have a cannabis product. Um, well, hopefully not out in public like that, right? You're not supposed to be smoking um, it in that regard. Not smoking, <laughs> not smoking. <laughs> Um, no, but you know, um, it's, I, um, I, I felt I had some reservations when we first visited this Commissioner O'Brien and then I, uh -huh. I, I got more comfortable. So I just maybe, you know, just have had a little bit more thinking. Um, and, and I was at Fenway and I, and I did notice, uh -huh. um, but we also up until up until August 1st, I went to Fenway and our other licensees had their, their brand there. Yeah, that, and, it's a concern and, I have um, in that regard and, too, quite frankly. Right, and that's why we did turn to advertising last September mm -hmm. um, in a way that we hadn't right. really dug into advertising um, and it continues to be an area where there's great exploration I'm really pleased to see, um, you know, so many of the um, leaks uh, come out this past week with affirmative mm -hmm. statements around it. Um, but I wonder about if we, if that, if that were language were added, Commissioner O'Brien, up on the, we shouldn't just pick on. I know sure. well, that would that satisfy you know really all of all of our issues right mm -hmm. yeah can I just add one quick clarifier there sure. so the green monster ad by the way the bet MGM one I think we're referring to that has a call to action and does in fact have both the game sense and the 21 language on it but an example uh, here from a recent game I was at of uh, the Bruins logo on the ice where it, or sorry, the, um, there's a operator the logo part. just on the ice as part of the ice where the other, there are other non-industry logos. So that's what they're talking about but, here. But the, Chris, the Green Monster yeah. ad is an ad. It's well, Crystal, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that's true. I think there was another operator too, but I, if that language was there, it certainly wasn't visible. So um, on, on the Green Monster, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I just saw the, I, I would have to look again. I that was one that I had looked at that they had given me. So it may be a different location, but the it's, one that I have shows that. Um, it's just um, I, I might be wrong. I, it, it, there could be several placements there off on yeah. an R, but so that yeah. might not be the same one. But I had just seen the one and, on the ice the other day and was yeah, thinking. We, and there were a couple of our licensees that had the branding um, at Fenway. Um, And, and from my perspective, when I saw it, I did say, well, it's in compliance because I was thinking of this reg as amended um, to uh, take out the word branding. So. Commissioners, where are we on this? How are we feeling? Commissioner Skinner, Commissioner Hill. I have no problem with removing the language, but I understand the concern. 
Likewise, I, I don't see a reason to revisit. I don't personally, but I do respect Commissioner O'Brien's concerns. And so if we need to revisit, um, we, sh we should do that. But for today's purposes, I'm fine with um, proceeding without uh, that language in. Commissioner Maynard? Uh, I, I'm fine with removing the language. What I will say is I share Commissioner O'Brien's concern and I really don't want the exception to swallow the rule and then have an operator say, well, oh no, that, that was wasn't an ad, that was just branding. That's exactly. right. And that's however we have to manipulate this reg to make sure that doesn't happen. That's how I'm, I'm okay with an operator having a, a logo on the parquet, right? Uh, on a TV garden. But, but again, I don't want the... Uh, I don't want it to swallow the rule. That's well put, uh, Commissioner Maynard. I think that's how I feel too. Um, I, and I share, um, Commissioner O'Brien, I think I, I noted earlier, your concern and mm -hmm. just might've just been gotten a little bit more comfortable earlier. Uh, it, it does oh, present Madam the Chair. practical problem for the operators, Commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner Hill, yes. So Mina. Um, I, I like the word that uh, Commissioner Maynard just used. Is there a way we can manipulate this regulation to um, alleviate the concerns of um, Commissioner O'Brien and leave it as is until you come forward with that manipulation? Um, I, I think one way we could do that and try to get at a, a more nuanced version uh, would be if, if the consensus, you know, I, I think what the, the operators are wondering is whether they can or can't do something in the meantime. And so if the, mm -hmm. and, and obviously some of these, um, I, I'm glad I'm not the only one that watches the green monster signage more than the game, but it had the same, had the same reaction, you know, obviously these are pretty big signs that would not be easy to change overnight. If the commission's take is that mm -hmm. you're letting these be during that time, perhaps through a, a waiver while we bring it back, I think that might work. But there is this concern out there about, um, you know, is it, a, is it or is it not okay right now? If that makes sense, Commissioner Hill. In other words, yes, we can certainly try to come up with something that says, for instance, uh, I mean, just thinking on the fly, um, we might say, um, I, you know, because what I want to do is make sure we're, we're already covering a lot of the targeting in other portions of the reg. So that's already captured. Um, but if there's some other nuance there that we could add to it, that might help. But we don't, but there is still, they're, they're out there now. So this is, I, and the commission's aware of them. So I think operators just want to know the, the stance on it. Could we define branding, Nina? Sorry, Commissioner one, I was going to ask that very question, but I wanted to clarify for the commissioners, as I am looking at the green monster images yeah. from 2023, yeah. I do not see any language other than MGM. Um, and that's how I remembered it at, when I went um, recently as well. well actually, it, it's, it, it may it, have changed. It, it did change. It was um, MGM, the casino before. And actually, I'm looking at an article, so I feel like I'm not speaking out of turn from just my own. Uh, right. but an article came out March 8th from the Sports yep. Business Journal. The logo for Bet MGM will be smack and the logo. And I think that might be our defining point for Bet MGM will be smack in the middle of Fenway Park's green monster in left field as part of the betting company's new role as the official sports betting partner of the Red Sox. Goes on to say that Boston based DraftKings, which has been the team's official mm -hmm. daily fantasy partner since 2021, sits atop Fenway's Green Monster seats. And those are the two that I did observe. I did not see any language. I saw strictly the logo That's um, what without any call to action. Right. And that was how I remembered this discussion. So um, I, as I was enjoying my green onions, uh, green peppers and onion sausage, I, um, I uh, was being a little bit worried about compliance. So, um, so I, so I Mina, see I, that, and I do see MGM uh, rewards here. So that must be an mm -hmm. older, an older one. 
um, ad that's popping up because it was definitely that MGM now. So, so Mina, the question is, can we define um, branding? Brand. Um, we can, I'm just confirming that it's not already defined in the statute, but um, we can certainly try to define branding. I, could, we'd want to give it some that? thought. The, the issue with defining it is, I, I, again, I think what I'm hearing is not necessarily, it, it can, the branding may be in different, in different places. So for instance, let's use a t-shirt example. I, I think you probably will define it in a way where a t-shirt covers it. Does it, you already, if you make kid size t-shirts, that'll be barred by other sections. Uh, if you made t-shirts that had a Boston College logo and an operator's logo, that would be barred by other sections. Um, but if you made an adult size t-shirt, um, I, I guess if the consensus, if that is okay, if that is part of branding, um, that something can fit into that. It's um, trying to figure out where the Delta is, You know what we want to call branding that is covered and isn't covered. Also keep in mind, branding is used in a lot of other places in the statute where right. we do want it, want everything to go with it. So branding of any kind, including just a logo, can't be on, like I said, a kid's t-shirt. We don't want to define branding in a narrow way to do that. I think what would make the most sense is if you're trying to allow for just a display of the logo without a call to action. Uh, we can look back at the comments. I do recall several operators, some operators had said to strike it, some had thought of other ways to sort of add more complicated language about that if it's in a in signage um, or, or other places. So we, we could look at that. I still have no problem removing uh, the word branding, but I understand the concern of a couple of my fellow commissioner so if we can somehow come up with a um, alternative for the word branding maybe that will answer and address our issues crystal did you want to add in anything further just to help us out and i'm i'm in agreement with commissioner hill um for maybe future uh but crystal just make sure we've thought about this fully anything else. I would also have to review uh, some of those comments, but I'd agree with Mina that there were a few um, examples of how other jurisdictions have handled this section, um, the, the particular use of logo, especially in, in a business context, as opposed to in a marketing context, um, right. and, and or um, just actual sports placement alongside other brands. But um, I don't have anything further to add. I just think that the clarifier there that a lot of them were articulating was like business card, letterhead, like really the way it is now, it has to be on anything and everything. Um, and it sounds like you guys are working toward a way to define or identify the separation there. So. Right. Um, I guess that's what I'm looking for. Like you said, Crystal, is, is maybe those comments have it in there how to thread the needle of this is purely business plus 21 at, you know, no risk of exposure. This is really a marketing slash branding. And, and in that context for me, then there should be a 21 plus in the latter. Let's see where we are. Commissioners, I think that I was hearing a consensus um, with, with respect and recognition of Commissioner O'Brien's consternation um, that we could go ahead, keep the, the word branding out for now and then explore perhaps opportunity for clarification. Is that a fair assessment? Um, I am, don't wanna speak for you. So everybody yeah. chime in. I'm probably a no, um, absent reaching that language that threads the needle, but I think you've accurately conveyed sort of the the temperature of the commission. Um, I, I'm not sure that you were accurate in the way I was thinking. I was, I was willing to keep everything as is, keep the branding in there until oh. we received um, clarification. Uh, I was willing to do that so, um, for, for Commissioner O'Brien. I'm, I'm going to join Commissioner O'Brien also. I'm going to point out that the reason um, why I'm having concerns is that I am appreciating the, the issue, but there might be significant practical issues here. 
Um, and I guess I'd want to think about that because what we'd be saying is if we keep branding in, um, folks at Fenway and any all those letterheads and all, they're going to have to be altered immediately. Are we okay with that? To add that language? I, I think I heard Mina say we could do an exemption for those until we got the language. Did I mishear that? That's where I, that's where I need the clarification, so. Um, yeah, which we uh, do, which we did before, by the way. I I, I want to get it right. I mean, I, I think that getting it right is more important than anything else. And I mean, obviously, they're operating right now. I was I've, I've been to a few Celtics games, and I saw them the branding on the floor. Um, I mean, I, I would want them to not have to immediately, as you said, Chair, make these changes, but I do want to get the drawing of the bright lines correct. How long of a period of time do you guys think in terms of going back, looking at the other commentary and being able to come back with proposed language do you think you would need? I don't think we need long on our end, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. My only, you know, only a couple it's of things. It's, it's the, just a timing of when it can come back to you for a vote is, is really what, what I'm thinking of. You know what? Do you have any recommendations? I. Um, you know, I am thinking of Crystal's list of, you know, even letterhead business cards, anywhere that logo is. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned in that article, the, it was the word logo. Right. Uh, and, and no call to action. Um, I'd At a certain yes. point in time, I wonder, are we, are there any legal restrictions on us in terms of what we can actually impose on it? Or we can. There, there are limits, but I do think requiring a 21 plus wouldn't be, you know, outside of that. Um, okay. I, okay. you know, the, I do think the takeaway from some of the prior meetings was at least an understanding. And I think that's why um, yourself and others, uh, you know, didn't blink to see to see it without the twenty one plus in a place like Fenway, perhaps um, myself included. Um, so uh, one suggestion might be, um, since we are trying to both get this right, but also not cause a upheaval in the middle, um, perhaps if I could suggest a sort of more limited waiver than you a waiver, uh, you know, for a week or two, I don't think it's going to take us longer than that to come up with language or to come back and tell you that I think there's just, that I think that the, what I'm struggling with is um, I appreciate the desire for a bright line rule. Um, at the end of the day, whether something is, I think the business purposes part is easy. It's sort of not coming out as advertising. I might argue that that's not you know, really captured anyway, but you, you know, you could sort of cleave that out pretty easily. It's right. the um, branding, the, you know, it's, I think the commission needs to, to have a decision. Would you want ideally a 21 plus uh, sign or, or message in some way uh, on those variety of other things? And then it gets more complicated. If you're talking about, um, you know, a, a sign in a public place like the garden or the green monster, um, a t-shirt um, and, and would you distinguish product by product? Um, so that's, that's where I think you're, it's gonna be hard because all of those, you could probably move one into a de definition of branding or not, that they are clearly used for marketing and advertising a brand. Um, so there's, it's, it's how, how you want to distinguish them or what you want to be the defining factor is I think what I'm looking for that between when you want the message and when you don't. And if it's place of usage, I think you already are covered by the rest of the regulation. If it's 
targeting of, of underage folks, you're probably already covered by the regulation. So if we're talking about um, medium, then I think we just need to think about what, what media are okay and which are not. I, I would also add, you know, one of the other things is you can't put it on things that are target. I think we've talked about this one before, things that would be um, where the medium itself mm -hmm. might be conducive to, or sort of suggest underage use. You know, you're not gonna put on a, not to be, to use an extreme example, a rattle, right? So that's, that's an obvious one, but there might be obviously other ones. So. Could you give the obvious again? I missed it. Either. Sorry, a rattle, right? You would have put on a baby rattle. Um, and so, um, yeah, but, or, or, or a toy. Um, I think that's actually might be explicitly in here. Uh, toys or other paraphernalia like that. Um, so I, I apologize to, I don't mean to make it more confusing, but I think the dividing line isn't necessarily going to be clear by defining branding because it's really you know, I think reasonable minds could differ whether you want a 21 plus sign or not uh, at the garden at, at the, at, on the green monster. It doesn't change that it's branding. It just changes whether you're going to add that feature to it. Mm -hmm. The business use, I think, is an easier carve out that, that we could probably do, you know, with a um, very easy. So. have something within a couple of weeks, Madam Chair, that I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I, I feel what you have said. I think a couple more weeks won't hurt. I might suggest then a waiver for call it a month. Um, we'll get it back to you within a month. And then when we bring the new language back, if it's approved, we might also have to consider a secondary waiver for things that are sort of already up and would take a little bit of time to change depending on how this goes. But um, I think just to, to get through today, a waiver would work and then we'll come back to you quickly. Could I ask if we could look um, at what other jurisdictions have done on mm -hmm. this issue, please? Um, <clears throat> in addition to the comments that we've gotten already, you mean? In addition to the yep. comments we've gotten already. Yep. Uh, Thank you. I think um, the AGA, we should turn to them too to see if they've addressed this in any way. They've been coming out um, really quite proactively on things. Most recently, I'm not sure if they've addressed this particular issue. Okay, other comments? Um, so we're gonna give it, uh, Caitlin's asking for one month. Commissioner Hill, are you comfortable with that? I got a thumbs up from one commissioner. Commissioner Skinner, how are you feeling about this? Waiver is, and whether it's 30 days or, or, or longer, um, that's the only way I can kind of um, come on board with, with this. I think Mina laid out the conundrum quite nicely. I really am struggling with the impracticality of requiring, um, you know, the branding in or, or um, not removing that language um, as it applies to, you know, t-shirts and baseball caps and the like. So I do think we need to figure out a way if we are going to define branding, we, we need to put our heads together and, and gather some additional information so that we can, so we, we can um, make it make sense um, and, and easily understood by um, the industry. Um, but I'm okay with um, some form of a waiver um, and whether we have, need to have that uh, language added now or how, how do we determine the process of the waiver and, and the application of it? Is it just across the board? Does, does an operator have to apply for it? How does that work process-wise? I would do an across the board waiver, I think. Um... Just because, like you know, like they said, there's probably business cards out there. Everyone's probably probably has the issue. Um, so I would do an across the board waiver for that particular section related specifically to branding. And if if I can guide that conversation a little bit in terms of what you guys are looking for in terms of threading the needle, where I'm drawing the line conceptually is to be the recipient of a static sort of forced exposure to me on something on the green monster is different than an individual adult who has chosen to purchase a baseball cap, a t-shirt, coasters in an over 21 bar. That to me 
is a line that can be drawn. That's where I'm looking for this, is that if you're going to be coming in where you're going to have people even above and beyond, you, you can't market there at all if you don't know that 75% plus is going to be over the age of 21. Even if it's static and it's going to be sort of this forced exposure, I think the 21 plus is warranted. That's where I'm coming from. And I, I agree with that 100%. And I acknowledge your distinction, but I, I thought I also heard Nina say that in the, in the latter situation, our regs cover us. Did I misunderstand that, Nina? Uh, uh, Commissioner Skinner, I think um, yeah. we're talking about two slightly different things. I think in, in the situation where you know the event is going to be, uh, or the arena is gonna, going to be 25% or more, Underage folks, uh, a call it well, caution is the word, but a particular children's event at Fenway, they might have to cover it up. However, at a regular baseball game, there's really no way of knowing, and there isn't an expectation, is not an expectation will be more than 25%. And I think what Commissioner O'Brien is saying, you'd like to see that 21 plus message there as well. Correct, correct. Okay, so the waiver would be for one month. We'll explore other jurisdictions, other um, stakeholders who can inform all sides of the conversation. Um, operators do not have to do anything different right now. They relied on the fact of our earlier conversation. Um, today was actually to, to um, bring up the reg into conformity with our earlier vote. So they are um, operating in compliance with our earlier vote. Is that fair? Um, so it would just be a waiver of our earlier vote um, to exclude branding from this, this requirement. Um, Madam Chair, just to not a waiver from the earlier vote, a waiver from the inclusion of branding at this moment. Right. Okay, that's good, thank you. Um, But in other words, we don't have to do it. Um, we didn't act today on this. This was done in the past, so the operators had been complying. That's really what my point is, um, right? Uh, branding was not to be um, required under our current reg, was not required. Or because there was a mistake made, was it required? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to reading the reg, it was required. But if you're looking at intentionality of the prior vote, that's right. They were, they, they were, might have been moving as if it and was. We all, not we all are in agreement with that, correct? Okay. Thank you. That's really my point. And so they can continue to operate as they were operating for one month. And we revisit this for one month and we'll see if there's going to be a change. Okay. Everybody in agreement with that, Mr. Skinner? Yes. Um, my question is, do we need a vote? That's. I think we do. Yeah, I think Gary just disseminated some waiver language. Yes. Uh, which I'm happy to move on you know, to keep the ball rolling. Uh, I move that in accordance with 205 CMR 202.02 sub 3, that the commission issue a waiver to all licensed sports wagering operators from the requirement currently outlined in 205 CMR 256.05 sub one, that branding stating that patrons must be 21 years of age or older to participate and shall be in effect through May 25, 2023, as granting the waiver meets the requirements specified in 205 CMR 102.03 sub four, and is consistent with the purposes of general laws, chapter 23N. Second. So I have actually a question about this. This is my concern. It sounds as though we're giving a waiver to exclude to exclude branding, but we actually already excluded branding. Um, Madam Chair, I'm not. I, I think just to be clear, when I said it was a, a miss, miss, you know, inadvertently left in there, we included branding in some places and not others. This right. was not a simple clerical error. I think we yeah. left it in there and didn't discuss taking it out. So we were coming back to make sure you knew it was right. still in there. So I, I do think a waiver is necessary because what's on the books with the Secretary of State's office includes the word branding. Got it, thank you. All right, thank you for the second, Commissioner Hill. 
Okay, any Thank other you. questions or clarifiers? Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you, everyone. All right. So um, that concludes all of the items on our agenda. Do we have any other um, commissioner business? I have one item, and it's just an idea. But the AGA, there was an article that was just published in Las Vegas Review Journal that the American Gaming Association is um, looking at illegal gaming gambling websites and the headline is how they continue to prey on trusting players. We just had a really nice um, and fulsome discussion with Mark Vanderlinden on our research agenda. And in this article, it, it does address the AGA's been really looking at the impact of illegal gamblers. And they've actually even written um, a letter to a year ago to Attorney General Merrick Garland to ask the Justice Department to aggressively pursue prosecuting illegal operators to protect American consumers. Um, I thought it might be helpful to not only us, but even perhaps the AGA, ultimately if we might consider looking at the impact of legal camp, uh, sports wagering on the illegal uh, market. I, I don't know if we have room in the agenda, um, in our uh, research uh, uh, agenda framework, but um, I, I think it's, an, it's interesting. People do um, you know, question the, the benefits of, of this industry that we were asked to stand up. And, and we think about our regulatory responsibilities every, every day and part of our job is to assess impact. So I just wondered if there some if we could maybe circle back to Mark and see if there's an opportunity there for us to think about the impact um, kind of early on if there's a way to measure it over a certain amount of time the impact on the illegal market. So something for us to consider and bring to um, Director Vanderlyn and if you're in agreement. I know that he's going to go to the GPAC May fourth. Um, for feedback on as well. So I might, as a, as a member there, also raise this issue, but I just wondered what your thoughts were. Too much, Commissioner O'Brien? It's, it's big. It's big. <laughs> I mean, I love the idea, but that's a, that's a broad research scope. Um, I, I'm wondering if there's a way to get more specific about right. it. Yeah, so like, yeah, it, I took a broad brush stroke today, but maybe um, more specific. Commissioner, and Commissioner Brown, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yes. No. Commissioner Skinner? I was just thinking along the line, same lines as Commissioner O'Brien, particularly if we're talking about the FY24 uh, research agenda. I don't know, you know, how much um, the, the timing plays into, you know, whether or not Mark and his team can pull something like that together. Um, I also wonder about the availability of data on the illegal market. I mean, and I know that um, the AGA has conducted its own studies as, as uh, you know, you, you alluded to Madam Chair, but, you know, I think a deeper dive into what it is that um, we might be able to focus on in that, uh, in that research would be helpful. But the concept for sure um, makes sense to me. Okay, Mr. Maynard, Commissioner Hill. I'm highly interested in it, Madam Chair, especially, you know, a big motivator for me um, from August 1st forward was to, you know, really put the hammer down on the illegal market. Um, and, and it's why I wanted to, to move forward so quickly. And so I am interested in it and I think it's a great idea. Okay, so great. let's see them. Um, thanks, Commissioner Hill. You said agreed? Okay, got it. So let's see, um, uh, I don't think uh, Director Vanderlyn is here, but maybe um, something for him to put on his radar uh, and just maybe being able to get some kind of baseline, but I agree it could be a big in scale, but maybe there's a way to do some kind of a pilot of some sort. So 
All right, that was just on my mind and I, I commend the AGA for its work um, in this area. Anything else? Okay, so we need a motion to adjourn. And then just a reminder, Grace, where are we headed today? That's um, you six... are headed to the Everett City Hall for a public hearing that will begin at 6 p.m. this evening. Um, and if you didn't see the email from Joe, there will be parking available for the five commissioners. Um, and he sent directions in your inbox. Okay, and the, and the, with the address. And we should probably get there just a, what, like quarter of six. Um, the latest, right? Something like yes, that. I think Just, that would be good. Keep okay. traffic in mind. Keep it will be rush mind. hour. And uh, Grace, we've we haven't received too many comments, but you're going to make sure we um, before the end of the day that we have those in our email box. Yes, we have received one written comment so far, which I will send to you all. Um, and we have a few three speakers currently lined up, but I'm sure more will be at the hearing. That's right. And and if it's three. And it's the three that we'll be happy to hear from, and we are happy to be there for two hours. And Commissioner Maynard, you'll be joining by um, video. Um, we are thinking of your family. Okay. Um, Thank you. Welcome. Um, there's a fillet of fish right down the street, so we're jumping on that before we come. Oh, Commissioner Hill. You know, um, I I I may actually jump right on that. So. Is it drive through? Because otherwise I, I'll join you in person. All right. Uh, so I have a motion to adjourn. And, and great work, everyone, today. Thank you so much. Commissioner Hill. Move to adjourn. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you. Second? Second. Excellent. All right. Any discussion? All right. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Hill. Aye. Commissioner Skinner. Aye. Commissioner Maynard. Aye. And I vote yes. Five zero. And again, thank you to Executive Director Wells for um, uh, living through today's uh, uh, meeting. Uh, it was a very, very good discussion. We're, we're very, very grateful for your work. Thank you, everyone.